trying to figure out how to get the people in the room to listen to Zoom because um, they can't right now. They can hear us, but they can't hear Zoom. Um, we have two audience members, and actually they both do have PA receivers, and so that's actually working. But if two more as registered show up, we don't. Our two other receivers for the PA system is not working. So that is a problem we're trying to troubleshoot now. Um, yeah. Ah. Uh. Stay, stay tuned. Hold on.
Can you hear? Uh, I don't Cordy, know who me was. Okay. Angel. Angel? No. Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Close the yeah, door. sounds good. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Lisa. Okay, and we're on air, Mr. Mayor. All righty then. Um, I'm going to have to pull this to be able to do this. I, I call the. No, oh, they're not going to go here. Let me know if you guys can hear us. It's laying down there. We can hear you. Can you hear? I can hear you. All yeah, right. We can hear you. Here we go. <laughs> I call the 2316th meeting of the Milwaukee City Council to order. This meeting is being conducted partly by video conference and with members of council here at City Hall. The public has been invited to watch the meeting via the city's YouTube channel, Comcast Cable Channel 30 and City Limits, or by logging into Zoom video conference as an attendee. The public may submit comments in writing by email to ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. There will also be opportunities for limited in-person testimony. The public has been invited to speak during this meeting by registering by email to ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. The deadline for registering was yesterday, June 1st at 3 p.m. When it is time to take public comment, staff will monitor the email inbox, the Zoom participant window, the Zoom chat, and the in-person audience at City Hall to see if anyone would like to speak. We will take comments in the order they are received. If members of the public become disruptive, we will mute and remove them from the video conference or from chambers. If that fails to stop the disruptions, we will recess the meeting and return within five minutes. If we are unable to continue, council will briefly meet off air to move unfinished business to the next council agenda. All right, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice, all for Mayor? As you are about to begin. The city of Milwaukee respectfully acknowledges that our community is located on the ancestral homeland of the Clackamas people. In 1855, the surviving members of the Clackamas signed the Willamette Valley Treaty, known as the Kalipuya, etc. Treaty, with the federal government in good faith. We offer our respect and our gratitude to the indigenous people of this land. I think we find ourselves in a moment we find ourselves in a moment tonight um, where yet another sector of uh, our fellow Americans is decrying the treatment that they've received for 400 years, rightfully so. Um, and I think uh, it will do us all well to consider uh, from our privilege standpoint, uh, what we have caused and what we need to do to make reparations. Mayor, before you continue, uh, tonight we, sorry, this is Ann. Go. Sorry, Mayor. Uh, before you continue, we have received a request to bump the um, public comment portion uh, tonight up before you vote on the consent items. So I just wanted to make sure you saw that it's out of order on your agenda. Okay. All right, we can do that. Um, first, I have the announcements. All right, the North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District is now offering select fitness classes through Zoom. The goal is to provide residents with opportunities to exercise with an instructor and experience the camaraderie of a fitness class virtually, while allowing for social distancing and keeping people safe during COVID-19. Free workshops are being held so residents can sample all of the classes before signing up. Um, those who take a free workshop get a 10% off of the class and seniors get an additional 25% off. To learn more and to pre-register, visit www.ncprd.com. 
Five of Milwaukee's Neighborhood District Associations, or NDAs, are holding virtual meetings in June using Zoom, including Hector Campbell, Llewellyn, Linwood, Island Station, and Arden Walt Johnson Creek. If you haven't attended your NDA meeting in the past, this is a great time to check it out from the comfort of your home. Keep in mind that if you live, own property, or business, or represent a nonprofit in one of Milwaukee's neighborhoods, you are already a member of your NDA. Participation is free, and funding is available to accomplish neighborhood goals. Information about how to join your NDA using Zoom is available on the city's web calendar, accessed directly from the city's homepage at www.milwaukeeoregon.gov. In consideration of residents and visitors to the city during the coronavirus pandemic, the city is canceling all upcoming summer events through September. This includes our Carefree Sunday and NDA concerts that usually occur in August. Other events are being canceled or, po or postponed as well, so be sure to check the city's event calendar on the homepage to get the latest information about upcoming events. For more information about each of these events and others, please visit the city's homepage at www.milwaukeeoregon.gov. Um, our next item is the LGBTQIA and Pride Month proclamation, and this will be presented by Council President Falconer and Council Heisey. Councilor Heisey, would you like to start? Um, I'm still finding my place in the uh, <laughs> script. <laughs> well, I will. If you'd like me to start, I'm happy I can. Yeah, go for it. Thank sure. you. Um, got some thoughts here and I'd like to expand just a little bit today um, because of where we find ourselves in the greater context um, so this will this will this will speak to um, pride month um, as well as black lives matter um, I think that um, it's time for us to listen and um, that's where we find ourselves today. My daughter just learned to play Lean on Me by Bill Withers for a virtual school talent show. <clears throat> we all know the lyrics, and this song has always played a prominent role in our culture, having a bit of a resurgence during the pandemic, perhaps because of Mr. Withers' death in the midst of it, and the way it resonated with front frontline workers. But hearing her play the piano and singing the lyrics today they struck me as particularly poignant in this moment in America. It made me think about the centuries long heavy lifting that black Americans have done in this country in the fight for justice. And that tradition continued by our LGBTQ plus friends and family and neighbors. Today, you've probably seen a lot of white people on social media promoting a blackout temporarily swapping out their photos for a black screen to indicate that it's time to listen. Yes, it's time to listen and learn. It's also time to be that shoulder to lean on. And we cannot remain silent. The responsibility to ensure that our society lives up to its ideals cannot be borne solely by our black indigenous people of color, LGBTQ plus neighbors. White people must use our relative positions of privilege to do this work too. Be open to hearing when we fall short and promise to do better. Let's look for ways we can support our neighbors and colleagues and amplify those voices. Lean on me, I'll be your friend, I'll help you carry on. Tonight at Milwaukee City Council, along with our police force and other staff, we. We recognize George Floyd, who has taken us, who was taken from this world too soon, murdered by officers sworn to protect and serve. We can all agree that what happened to him was horrific. The callousness with which his life was treated was a disgusting display of hatred and violence. It is right for us to call it out. It is right for us to demand that justice be served, that those individual bad actors be held accountable. But after they've been arrested and after justice prevails, we cannot just move on. 
In the words of Robin D'Angelo, author of White Fragility, racism is not an event. It is a system. And not one of us is exempt from it. Institutional systemic racism is real and it is pervasive. It's why we continue to have ongoing disparities in housing and education and healthcare in the justice system and so on. <clears throat> it is deeply embedded in our culture and benefits white cisgender people at the expense of everyone else. I am proud of the work we're doing to together to confront bias and discrimination in our community, but we have much more to do. The budget proposal for the next biennium includes investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Council and staff, including our police force, will all participate. Later tonight, we'll have our first hearing on our draft comprehensive plan update. It takes some important steps in the right direction to break down barriers that exist in our land use system that are in the way of realizing our city's vision of an entirely equitable community. We haven't had any of the high profile officer involved incidents in Milwaukee, but our town is not immune from acts of hate and violence directed at Jewish, immigrant, black, indigenous people of culture and LGBTQ plus neighbors. Just this week, we received written testimony from a resident sharing some of the experience they've had as a queer immigrant living in Milwaukee. I was saddened and disappointed, but unfortunately not surprised. I want that person and everyone else in our community who does not feel safe doing everyday things in our community, that I am with you. I'm encouraged by many of the ways our community has responded to these types of incidents in the past and to the events happening all over around the country. There's a Hidden Hearts campaign that you might have seen on the news recently where neighbors have painted rocks and cut out paper hearts and done ch chalk art. And recently I've heard, I've seen members including rainbows and black hearts to show signs of support for Pride Month and Black Lives Matter. When hateful symbols were spray painted in one of our parks recently, community members, including members of this council, leap to action to remove them. These are symbolic small acts that make me proud of my community. We can do more and I know we're up to the challenge. Thank you, President Falconer, Council President Falconer. Um, I'll just add that as, as the um, queer member of our council right now and the proud third person in the row to, in, in a row to serve in position number four, who is queer, um, I pass as straight and I often don't experience that, um, that feeling of not being safe. But last week I, had the opportunity um, to be in a situation where I was reminded that my difference is dangerous with many people. Uh, it was not in Milwaukee, um, but I am grateful to some degree to have had that experience because it reminds me all over again how much work we have to do. And we all need to commit and recommit and be comfortable with failing and understand that um, this work takes a long time. And there are many people in Milwaukee who are loving and accepting and inclusive and will celebrate pride as allies and as members of the LGBTQIA community. And I'm thrilled, but we also need to recognize that it's not just celebration. Um, we're, it's important to celebrate. It's important to take that moment to look at how far we've come. It's also important to use that moment to say, all right, what else do we need to do? Councillor Heisey, before we go on, a uh, comment did come in, uh, and I just uh, was from somebody who wanted to make a comment before this was adopted, and it's pursuant to uh, the resolution. So if you're okay, I'd like to read that into the record. And, and before, but, before you do that, they also indicated they'd be interested in speaking. I don't want to know if the mayor or council is interested in, I can, I see them in, um, they're a participant and I can promote them to speak if that's 
Okay. And I believe okay, that's thank you. East. Thanks, Scott. So, I mean, I, I saw her statement, too, or their statement, too. So, e, you. you've been allowed to speak. Thank you for this opportunity. I don't, I don't expect to be able to, to participate during this portion of the meeting, but I appreciate it. I'm just, I'm curious. Um, I read over the resolution. Actually, uh, Councillor Heisey was the one that reached out to me and told me that you would be voting on this today. Um, and I noticed, um, uh, first of all, I, I think it's just amazing to have something like this um, so publicly and so kind of um, celebrated and supported by the entire council in the city of Milwaukee. As a queer resident, this is this kind of means a lot to me. But I was curious if someone could highlight to me how the definition for LGBTQIA plus was created. Um, I noticed just in my reading of it that questioning was put in place of the word queer. Um, in every resource that I've been able to access, list in the Gay and Lesbian Straight Education Network, the GSA Network, the LGBTQ Task Force, etc., I found that the first Q is usually uh, in the acronym is usually for the word queer and not questioning. As a queer resident, I was kind of surprised to not have that in the proclamation and, and in the image at the bottom of the document. Thank you for that. I will confess that I didn't read this closely because it is the same proclamation we used last year <laughs> with one minor tweak. And uh, you're right, we, we um, did not mean to do that. So thank you. And we can correct that in the document. So we'll make sure that the signed document has it correctly. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, and I don't know if there's a way to change that image as well, because it, it, it says the same thing in the image. Um, it's beautiful, and I'd love that to be a sticker that I can hand out, but um, I thought that word was changed. Absolutely. If you have, you, I don't know if you've got a screen or not, but we do already have these lovely stickers. Oh, no. I have plenty of those. <laughs> you got, okay. <laughs> we'll talk to Jordan in the morning to see where that image came from. And if it's possible, we'll also correct it on the image before signing. If it's not possible, we'll make sure it's corrected on the base document so that in future years, the image is corrected. Would it be possible to, um, I mean, I, I think if, if we correct it in the text and, you know, maybe it could just be cropped if it's, if, if it's, a, if it's a matter of time or... Mm, yeah. Yeah. Let me talk it. to Jordan in the morning. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We can fix it. Oh, there you go. I thought it was Jordan, but evidently it was Scott. We can fix it. Nice work, Scott. You. Thank you, Scott. So am I seeing this right? The only place that it occurs that way is in the paragraph. And the image. Well, yeah, the image. But I'm not really yeah. Yeah. And Mayor, you're on mute on Zoom. Thank you. Yeah. That actually works for me. <laughs> okay. So, Mayor, uh, I do also have a question. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to take away from this moment for the proclamation. But I would, uh, and Chief Straight and I do have some comments we'd like to make. So if you're open to it, I'd like to to approve the resolution and then uh, move into a conversation about the death of George Floyd. Is that fair? Yeah, that was kind of my plan. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So. Whereas the fight for equality continues for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, LGBTQIA, and other historically marginalized members of our community. And the responsibility falls on all of us to form a more inclusive society. And whereas June 28th, 2020 marks the fifth, uh, 51st anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, six days of demonstration sparked by targeting and arrest by police of gay, lesbian, and transgender bar patrons in violation of their civil rights, an event widely recognized as the beginning of the modern gay rights movement. And whereas on June 2nd, 2000, President Bill Clinton declared June to be Gay and Lesbian Pride Month to commemorate the June 28, 1969 Stonewall Uprising. And on June 1st, 2009, President Barack Obama expanded the commemoration by declaring June to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Pride Month. And whereas the 2015 United States Supreme Court decision in Oberfell 
v. Hodges requires all 50 states to grant and recognize same-sex marriages, marking a major victory for LGBTQIA Americans and their families. Whereas despite the progress of recent years, LGBTQIA Americans continue to face discrimination and new attacks by the federal government on the, the legitimacy of their marriages and even the citizenship status of their children. Now, therefore, I, Mark Gamba, the mayor of the city of Milwaukee and municipal corporation in the county of Clackamas in the state of Oregon, do hereby proclaim June 2020 as LGBTQIA plus Pride Month in Milwaukee in support of our LGBTQIA plus family friends and neighbors and to state that love is love you are valued and welcome and your city stands with you uh, next item um do you want to do yours next before we do this okay yeah, I think it's it's um, it's worth doing now if that's if that's okay with you. I think they go well together. Um, so I want to. I'd like to start by just um, thanking Councillor Faulkner for her eloquent statements about the death of George Floyd. On May twenty fifth, twenty twenty, Mr. Floyd was killed outside of a store approximately three miles from where my mother's childhood home was. The video of Mr. Floyd and his final moments are excruciating to watch and anger inducing to say the least. His death comes on the heels of several other monument, uh, moments of cruelty, including the deaths of Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor. These deaths are crushing, but also insidious are the actions government has taken over the years to repress communities of color. As government officials, we are supposed to spend our careers working for the public. Mr. Floyd's death was the ultimate betrayal of that trust, and we must take responsibility for ensuring this stops. For the past eight months, a collection of staff have been meeting to move the city in a more equitable direction. I'm co-leading these discussions with Hannah Wells in the city recorder's office, and I deeply appreciate her leadership. Every building has at least one staff representative, and everyone cares passionately about moving equality forward in Milwaukee. Those staff are Brett Calver from Planning, Christina Fadenreck, Community Development, Kim Olson, the Library, Gary Ribello, HR, Luke Strait, the Police Department, Mark Inman, Police Department, Mary Heberlein, Planning, Peter Passarelli, Public Works, Steve Adams, Engineering, Tempest Blanchard, Community Development, and Jason Wax in the City Manager's Office. The team has partnered with Empress Rules, a local DEI consulting firm, to train our management team and this committee on how to move our organization forward. Council has been so supportive of this work through budget as well as encouragement, and we thank you. The chief is going to talk in a few minutes, but I wanted to call it something we are planning to do and ask for all of you to join us. The chief and I um, are planning a listening session to hear from our communities of color about the struggles they are facing and how the city can be the government they need us to be. And it's easy for us to create answers on how to fix things. But that would be disingenuous when I've never spent a day as a person of color. I can only be an ally, but I am committed to learning how to be that ally. I'm committed to being anti-racist and ask each and every one of the individuals involved in this meeting to join me. We will know more on the actions we can take following that listening session. The city is also purchasing books, How to Be an Anti-Racist and White Fragility for Council and the Committee. I had some great feedback from Principal Gelman about these words yesterday in my commitment. She would recommend holding the conversation when we can be in person. Food and relationship are a key part of building uh, this work. She has been such a gift, and I just want to call her out for one moment for being so incredible uh, as we are working through this process, and the community of Milwaukee is lucky to have her. Having said that, I expect there will be interest from Council in moving this work forward and possibly as a goal. Last year, we spoke about setting that work up for success. I continue to support that trajectory for this council. Making it a goal brings time, effort, and money. I asked Hannah to outline what our goals should be for this work, and she provided the following. Make lasting and measurable change. Be held accountable for our actions as well as our inactions. Recognize our positions of power and actively work to become agents of change. 
be responsible for educating ourselves on the history and institution of racism in our own community so that we may better understand how to dismantle that in an equal and inequitable institution that we have built and step back and give a platform to those voices that have been silenced. And I couldn't agree more. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the chief to make a few comments about the police department. Luke, you're on mute. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you, Council President Falconer and City Manager Ann Ober for your words and your thoughts. First and foremost, I join our community and the entire country in acknowledging the truly horrific nature of what law enforcement officers did to George Floyd in Minneapolis. None of us will forget the footage from that video. It is a shocking reminder of what the worst case scenario is of anger, confusion, sadness, and helplessness have impacted the entire country, but most of all, our communities of color. The only path forward now is to renew our commitment and dedication to identifying how and why this happened and systematically taking steps to break down structures of racial inequity at all levels. I believe this work begins with honest assessments and open dialogue within our organizations and our community. There are many procedures and practices currently in place in our agency to fight systemic racism. With that said, I recognize we are not perfect and there are always opportunities for improvement. Today, I pledge to renew our efforts to keep all members of our community safe, especially those that have been harmed by police practices which target people of color. These efforts will use of force training, officer accountability, hiring practices, community engagement, procedural justice and legitimacy, increased training related to implicit bias and diversity, equity and inclusion will also be key components. I believe organizational culture and internal accountability are key aspects of our current foundation for success. The majority of significant disciplinary events in the past 15 years were brought forward by individual department members who saw something and spoke up. It is my goal to perpetuate this culture so that Milwaukee officers know that both the community and their fellow officers have a high expectation. We routinely critique our own performance and critical incidents. We have hard conversations and hold each other accountable. We also review critical instances from across the state and across the country, using those as opportunities to examine our own policies and training to look for areas of weakness and opportunities to improve. We have a clearly written policy which articulates a duty for any officer to intercede if they witness an officer using force beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances. De-escalation techniques are embedded in our organization and we will continue to train and emphasize them in the future. Integrating a mental health component into our response to critical incidents will continue to be a priority and our partnership with programs such as the Behavioral Health Unit will continue to be critical. We acknowledge how even one tragic injustice such as this can further destroy our relationship with our communities of color. We agree that justice must be done and we embrace our to eliminate the influence of racism and bias within our communities. As a member of law enforcement for the past 25 years, I'm admittedly a passionate advocate for all those who dedicate their lives to this challenging career. I will have no success as a leader without consistently acknowledging how extremely challenging this job is and just how often our staff does an incredible job. I do often receive phone calls and emails from the community praising the professional and compassionate work they do. I absolutely acknowledge there are times when we come up short. We can continue to evolve and improve and we will work together with our community to do that. I believe if done correctly, we can set an example of the right way to work through incredibly challenging issues such as these, and the Milwaukee Police Department will embrace these challenges. 
I am happy to try and answer additional questions. I just, I want to say um, that Milwaukee is particularly blessed to have the police force that we have. In looking back through our history, I was able to find no, uh, at least the last 15 years, which is where I looked, I was able to find no instances of uh, racially motivated violence of any kind or, or um, any indication. And that goes purely to leadership, I think, and, and great hiring practices and all the things that the chief talked about. I, I believe that the goal of any police force should be to have the trust and the love of its community because it earned it. Behavior like what occurred in Minneapolis and in many other cities uh, is nothing short of evil. When the people with the sanctioned power of the government abuse and kill folks in their community, because they have a different colored skin. They are responsible for continuing to tear our society apart. This can no longer be tolerated. Racism can no longer be tolerated. It must be rooted out, it must be called out, and it must be expunged at all levels of government. It must be made clear to all that it is not accepted. And I think this is a moment where that quote, uh, I think it was Edmund Burke, said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, is so perfectly appropriate. White privilege is a very real thing. What we experience every single day is very different from what people of color experience every single day. Mothers of African-American teenage boys literally have to fear for their son's lives every single day. It is not something that I had to do. I commend Chief Strait and Milwaukee Police. And I look forward to Milwaukee once again setting the tone and creating leadership on another issue that is so critical to our society. And I look forward to working with the police force to do that. Thanks, Chief, very much. I just wanted to take a second to um, amplify a piece of what Anne said, and she mentioned that there were two books that we would be reading uh, as, <laughs> as soon as we could get copies, um, White Fragility and How to Be an Anti-Racist. Both of those are sold out across the country. You, you cannot buy a physical copy right now, which is the perhaps brightest moment of hope I've had in the past few days. Um, I, I talked to Anne about this earlier today, and um, she has reached out to the library to see if we can figure out a way to host uh, a book discussion. I would very much like to do that with Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee residents who would like to be a part of that. Because I know that I'm a racist. I'm not a racist by choice. I am because I was born and raised and breathe the same world we all live in here in America. And that makes it inevitable. And it is a hard thing to acknowledge and it is a hard thing to keep on seeing. And it is a hard thing to identify within myself. And I need help doing that. And other people who are interested in that work are my best companions in that. So I, I hope that we can figure out a way to do this through the library. Uh, it'll probably be some sort of Zoom discussion, I'm guessing. And it probably won't happen right away. But um, keep an eye out if you're interested. And I, I hope to 
have some conversations with people in the future. Uh, and we are purchasing those. They are on back order. So once we're able to get copies, we will make an announcement um, online for people who are interested in participating in that group. We'll create a group discussion around both books. Um, for now, what I would encourage is I'll work with each of you to download the books so that you have plenty of time to get through them. Uh, but these were both recommendations from Principal Gelman um, and things that and, and works that she felt like would really impact our ability to lead. So I appreciate her insight on that and I think it's a great opportunity for us to join with our community. I was going to actually ask a question. Does everybody have an audible? Yeah. 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 That would probably be a way we could get the book. <laughs> as what? Audible oh, is that? Audible. Uh, yeah. Apparently, I don't. Audiobooks. Audiobooks. No. Yeah. No. And if you got an e-reader, if you use an e-reader like a Kindle, you can also get the book right away, and you can probably access the the e-version through the library right away as well. Yeah. Uh, it is checked out for a very long time, but yes. <laughs> Um, I, but that's, that's why we're making the commitment. It's going to be easiest for us to have council download this. So it is something that I think we will work on this week. Uh, and just also transparently, um, I think it's a great time to read it as staff are preparing for their DEI training. So it's, it's a twofer for me. It's an opportunity for us all to be on in the same place together. Mm -hmm. I bet if we asked around, you might find that there are already physical copies that, that could be. There are because I know I have it, so yep. I'm willing to pass it along. No, I think that's great. And I, um, we have some friends in the community who are also willing to share paper copies if we need them. So uh, we'll talk about that offline, but it is something that we will work on for later in the summer. Thank you for doing that, Ann. I really appreciate that. It was all Councillor Heisey's idea, but I will take credit for it. Um, <laughs> I do think, though, it's an opportunity um, we have partners in this community who are people of color, who are incredible humans and are leading us. And um, I can't thank Principal Gilman enough for her leadership of me. Good. Will that anything? Okay. And I will move on. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Thank you all very much. Uh, our next item is the extension of the COVID-19 emergency declaration. This will be presented by our city manager. This is not exciting. It's exactly the same <laughs> as it was a month ago. Um, we are going to do this now and we're going to do it again in two weeks just because we then uh, don't have another meeting into July. Uh, so you're going to hear this back to back. The reason at this point of community members are wondering why we are still declaring the emergency is there are still funding packages that are coming out that help fund this work. And you have to be in a declared state of an emergency in order to receive those funds. So we will continue to declare an emergency until we have our feet under us. Um, and it looks like we have um, participated and exhausted those resources for our community. As of, for instance, this is where the $35,000 has come from for our business assistance funding that is on top of the 132000 that the council already put forward. All right, so we entertain a motion. I move to extend the emergency. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make noise. I need to extend the emergency declaration related to COVID-19 through June. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Angel. Sorry. I should have just left. Um, I move to extend the emergency declaration related to COVID-19 through June 16, 2020. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to extend the emergency declaration related to COVID-19 through June 16th, 2020. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard. It passes unanimously. Um, was there a different item on the consent agenda? 
So I, I think that the desire is for us to go into public comment first. There is a public comment about the police contract, the union contract. And so if you'd like to take the public comment first and then return to that, that would be great. All righty then. I believe that comment is um, from E. It is. But uh, do we want to go through the whole read-in of public comments, Mark? Yeah, I'm going to do it. All right, this is the part of the agenda during which council will hear community members' statements regarding city business. Those wishing to speak and who have registered with the city and are logged into Zoom or are present at City Hall, please raise your hand or indicate you wish to speak. Before you make your comments, please clearly state your name and city of residence for the record. If you would like the city to follow up with you, please submit your contact information to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. As council has other business items on the agenda this evening, speakers will be limited to three minutes each. Because the information provided during the public comment may be new to some councilors, the city manager will respond at the next council meeting to those comments that require follow-up. Before we begin, is there any follow-up from the May 19th audience participation, Ms. Ober? No, no follow-up. Thank you, Mayor. All right. So I am not seeing any hands raised. So is it it's E? It's E. It is. Okay. And e? Actually, there is one hand raised. Uh, it's Neil Schulman, but I believe Mr. Schulman wants to speak during the comp plan. So I'm going to um, lower that hand for now. But Mr. Schulman, well, we know you want to speak at the comp plan. Raise your hand again if that is not the case, Mr. Schulman. <laughs> All right, E, please go ahead. Yeah, so my comments just pertain to the fact that I, I, maybe I'm not paying enough attention to what's happening at these meetings, or maybe I'm not understanding enough about this process, but I'm really concerned that, um, especially in light of things happening around the country, that the council is deciding to vote on um, a police contract right now. Um, I don't feel like there has been enough um, or an extension of a contract. I, I couldn't find that contract anywhere online, including on the city website. Maybe I'm not looking in the right places. Um, and I feel like things that are being discussed right now a lot in, in my experience of, of being in, um, working with the downtown protests of Black Lives Matter, um, like like having cameras on or having a greater amount of, of data collected on how police are interacting with community, especially as my partner has been a person that has twice been stopped by police in the city of Milwaukee for fitting descriptions of someone jumping fences, I think is what he was told, when he was walking with our dog in the neighborhood. Um, and so I think those kinds of things don't often come up because they're not reported in a way that, that makes sense. My partner actually didn't chose not to report that because he didn't feel safe because the police knew then knew where we lived lived and even though I don't feel any fear from the police having any kind of retaliation he definitely does and so I think because our community is is in a place of, of mourning and, and honestly a lot of fear and frustration I think we need to think about having a, a more public process to these kinds of, of things especially when things are in such a, a wild place right now so that, that's kind of my comments Um, so the, I have something I would like to say to that, but I'd love it if the chief or Anne could talk about where we are and why we're in the moment we are with the uh, contracts, and then let's talk about what the very near future holds. Absolutely. Um, and chief, if you want to correct me on anything, feel free to jump in. But. Um, this, what has been discussed on council agenda a couple times, and E, I'll send you those that uh, the, the both the contract and the um, the historical discussions around this. So uh, we'll make sure that that's really clear. So I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, the second piece is we are um, at the start or end of a budget cycle. We're about to start our new budget cycle. Uh, and when we were supposed to start these negotiations with our police union, we uh, started COVID and the shutdown at the same time. So we were about one to two meetings into that process and uh, simply ran out of time. We had a few individuals who were going to be in the room who were over the age of 65 and we were concerned about their safety um, and having them uh, 
in, in the midst of COVID. So we decided uh, in partnership with our union to extend this contract to create a new contract, but it's a one-year contract instead of being an ongoing contract. It's usually a two-year contract. That means that we're going to be back in negotiations in a few months in order to start addressing some of the concerns that you mentioned. Um, and if you're interested and willing, I'd love to sit down with you and hear your concerns. I know that Chief Strait would as well. Um, but that's kind of the reasoning right now as to why we're doing this. The only substantial change in the union contract, and I'm looking to Gary or Luke to correct me if I'm wrong on this, is um, the 3% pay that is equal to the pay that we were paying AFSCME and had already agreed to in the AFSCME contract. Yeah, there's some uh, language cleanup and some things uh, because of uh, new legislation um, having to do with fair share that we had to take out of the old contract, that type of stuff. But uh, we left about uh, four articles um, where we did not uh, tentatively agree on those. We left those as is. All the other articles had been tentatively agreed. So we'll have to pick up those articles and, and continue with uh, negotiations uh, early next year. Mayor, is there anything else you'd like me to say? Well, I was just going to ask the chief if he had anything to add to that. No. Okay. Um, so so the, the, the main gist of this e, is that um, any changes that we would engage in in the contract would obviously take a period of time, which is exactly the period of time that we have before uh, we would be going into negotiations in any case for the next year's contract. So um, my intent and, and others is to begin those conversations uh, with the community and with police force uh, this summer and then to be able to uh, in, in preparation for for the um, the con up upcoming contract negotiations, so uh, it's, the the only difference is is we we don't have a contract now if we don't re up this one, um, and this just gives us the time to do it properly and to uh, do it uh, in a really broad and communal way that Milwaukee tends to engage in these things. Uh, one thing that wasn't noted on the document is that the uh, MPEA has ratified the contract. All right. Thank you. Um, so now going back to tonight's consent agenda. Um, we have the meeting minutes of the May 5th, 2020 work session, the May 5th, 2020 regular session, the May 12th, 2020 study session. We have a resolution appointing Josephina Hedham, Therese Dudek, Lulu Freed, and Bailey Stokes to the Arts Committee. We have a resolution authorizing a one-year collective bargaining agreement with the Milwaukee Police Employees Association. Uh, does any member of council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? I will move to approve the consent agenda. All second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard the consent agenda passes unanimously. And Mark, I mean, before we go on, I don't know if others are hearing your voice reverberating, but but I am, and I don't know. I, I, it it's hard to understand what you're saying sometimes because I'm hearing it like twice. Ching ching ching. That that's how I hear it. If I leave this thing in my ear, if I take it out, I don't hear that. <laughs> I'm hearing it right yeah. now, but minimally as opposed to other times. So just FYI, I may have to ask for Is it possible as we go that forward. the audience computer uh, was on and so I just muted that. So maybe that would improve it. Okay, okay does that uh, help, Walda? Yeah, from what you just said, yes. Say, okay, good. say something again, it sounds good. All right, perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
next item is the adoption of a supplemental budget resolution. Uh, the public hearing on the proposed supplemental budget is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to take public comment on the proposed supplemental budget. Does any council member wish to announce actual or potential conflict of interest? No. No. Um, we I saw none, by the way, for those who can't see. Um, have we received, uh, oh, let's get the staff report from uh, Bonnie Dennis, please. Good evening. Um, tonight I'm talking to you about the supplemental budget that is um, before you. It includes actually two items. I'm going to cover uh, the first item is the Veterans Fund. Um, this is a budget transfer from revenue to materials and services and within the department the city uh, uses a contract to perform inspections when needed um, and due to the increase in the development the city has received throughout the course of the year um, I am proposing a transfer of twenty four thousand uh, dollars from the increase in revenue to materials and services to cover the contractual services component the second item is in accordance with Oregon budget law and with that there's appropriations uh, that are 10 percent or more of the fund or also in accordance with budget law is when a creation of a new fund needs to occur uh, it is required to hold a public hearing on those changes uh, previously city council has received information on the purchase of a new city hall located on main street and under budget law the city is establishing a new city hall fund to account for the purchase the renovations the lease pr payment proceeds and other costs related to the purchase the city hall fund will be used to track these items until such time that the renovations are complete which is estimated around fiscal year 2024 uh, and then at that time the fund will be depleted and the general fund will maintain the asset. The city is financing the purchase with a full faith and credit debt obligation of 6.7 million. The financing closes on June 17th. Additional funds are through transfers from the general fund and the library fund as noted in the resolution in the staff report. And appropriations are covered to debt to cover the uh, debt issuance costs and capital outlay, which is included in the which is included in the supplemental, as well as the purchase price is $6.5 million. The purchase of the building will close on June 20, 22nd. The debt service costs have been addressed in the proposed budget that will, was recently approved by the budget committee and will be brought forward to city council adoption on June 16th. This transfer and supplemental was also discussed during the budget hearings uh, for the proposed budget um, that was approved by budget committee on May 23rd. Any question? Not seeing any. Uh, is, have we received any additional correspondence on this topic? I haven't. Bonnie, have you received any correspondence? I have not. Does anyone wish to comment on the proposed supplemental budget? Any hands up? Nobody in the audience, Mr. Mayor, and I'm not seeing anybody on Zoom. Okay. And no emails to that effect. Uh, then I'm not going to read this whole part here. Does the council have any questions for staff? If there are no further questions from the council, I entertain a motion to close public hearing. So moved. Second. Is it moved and seconded to close the public uh, hearing? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The public testimony portion of the public hearing on the proposed supplemental budget is closed. Is there council discussion? Um, yeah, I did want to make a comment. Um, I had asked, uh, you know, we had a conversation uh, a month or more ago, well, longer than that, I guess, about um, financing the renovations. And um, I had asked um, about, uh, you know, there are so many unknowns, I think, 
about, you know, whether we might have other sources of money to finance those at the time, such as does is there a sale of this building, etc. Um, Bonnie inquired about a bond council, and apparently we would pay. A, a, apparently, there is a sort of a prepayment penalty, so. Um, that was bad news, I thought. Um, I'm still going to support this, but I do feel like um, I, I, I'm going to support it because there are so many variables now in the economy. Uh, and um, But I do think the other variable that's come up uh, since then out of COVID is, you know, how we allocate office space and how much office space we really need and how many more people a year from now will be working from home and being able to share offices because they're only in the office two days a week or something. Um, so I think there will be a lot of study to be done in um, uh, probably 2022 by the time things settle out about um, really how much office space we need across the city. And uh, whether you know, maybe we don't need all the space at, at the Johnson Creek facility, for example. So um, I do, I do think we will need to study that uh, as we see what the new ways of working are um, in the future. Um, but uh, because there is a prepayment penalty, uh, well, yeah, because there's so much financial uh, insecurity, unknowns at this time, I'm supportive of, of including the renovation money in this, but not without some reservations. I do just wanna um, talk to that issue for one second uh, to make sure that council's aware. So we're currently taking out about 6.7 million in debt um, and that is largely going to pay the building. I did hear Councillor uh, Beatty when she said that she was concerned about not knowing what the cost would be, whether or not there would be things that come up over time. Um, so we have front loaded all the, the bond money to the physical structure. Uh, that leaves us with general fund dollars that are more flexible as we get closer to the construction of the building. Uh, it's not perfect, and I appreciate everything Councillor Beatty has said. We do not know what office space is going to look like. I agree with her there. Um, but I just wanted to make sure people on air understood that we're not actually taking out money uh, for the renovation, we're taking out money and covering the full cost of the purchase and, and then the cost of doing the purchase. The rest of the money will is already allocated in our budget for next year that we're adopting in general fund dollars. I also think, I mean, it's, it's not an unreasonable thought that more people may be working from home in the future, uh, given the unknowns around this virus and, and others to come. Uh, but I also recognize, certainly with a lot of the young parents, uh, that having a work to go to <laughs> is a good thing. Uh, that they need the space, they need the, the quiet, the ability to concentrate. Um, so we're going to have to be rethinking a lot of the things that we do. Um, I can't help but think that having more space to work with, to create social distancing while people are working in place is going to be a, a good thing in the long run. Um, but who knows? We're going to know more in a year. Um, I will say just for the, the public on air, I don't currently see a way for us with the way our Johnson Creek facility is, is organized to be able to bring back more than 40% of our staff in that building at a time. So COVID had, has added a huge complexity to how we manage our staff. And, and I think that that and the fact that um, bond rates are very favorable right now and we have a very good rating so this is this is 
I mean, it, it's a horrible silver lining, right? But that's part of what we, um, it's one of the few places we actually have some small sliver of benefit from COVID is that uh, it's a good time to borrow money. And I would just also say that I really think that this investment in this building is uh, one of the places where we are making a strong investment in equity because in our current facilities, we will never be able to provide childcare for public meetings. Um, this new building will provide us at least the possibility where we do not have it now. And I think there are a host of other ways that it will be a, a tremendous investment in equity for the city. Any further conversation? Zelda, no? I'm good with it. You want okay. a motion? I would love a motion. I will give you a motion. I move to approve the resolution authorizing a budget supplemental for the 2019-2020 biennium. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the resolution authorizing a budget supplemental for the 2019-2020 biennium. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None heard. It passes unanimously. Okay, apparently we're going to skip around here a little bit because we're expecting the comp plan hearing to take a significant amount of time. We're going to skip to 6A. Uh, renewal of the housing emergency and no cause eviction rental protection measures resolution and ordinance. Uh, this will be presented by our community development director, Leila Amon. All right, good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Uh, Leila Amon, your community development director, and thank you for having me tonight. I'm bringing forward um, three items, and I am going to attempt to share my screen here um, so you'll get a chance to see if. Uh, I can manage that. And right now I am disabled. So I don't know, Scott, that's something you can enable for me. I just have a short presentation. Try it again. Great. There it is. Okay. Uh, everyone see that okay? Great. So today we have, I have three actions uh, to go through. Um, the first are approving resolutions to extend housing emergency and renter protection measures. And then um, based on some feedback from a previous meeting, we are asking for uh, council approval of an ordinance modification um, to the renter protection to be, uh, to change the, the time that we reconsider it to align with the housing emergency. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the presentation. Uh, first of all, I think it's, I just want to briefly kind of go back to where we started with this. Um, when we initiated the housing emergency, which has now been four years, um, it was really based on this concern that incomes weren't rising. There was a, a dramatic in, increase in rents and then vacancy levels were at an all-time low. When this was adopted, um, the vacancy rates in 2015 were 2.4%. Um, which is extremely low. Um, and what that indicates from a market perspective is that there is a massive amount of compression um, and that that indicates that there is a housing uh, shortage. So uh, council act acted in 2016, um, and these are the parameters that you set at that time. So you did it in the, in, to address shortage of housing um, to avoid human suffering. Um, you indicated that the housing duration will be for one year, um, but maybe extended in six month increments. And so we've done that since that time. And then we would terminate this when the emergency no longer existed or the threat of an emergency has passed. Um, so those are the indicators that we set for the housing emergency. At the same time and on the same day, you also approved a renter protection uh, ordinance and this was approved with the emergency and the main discussion around that time was that it acknowledged that a 30 to 60 day notice period for no, no cause evictions was not enough and so 
we strengthened that and proposed a 90 day notice for no cause. Um, and if not, that there were um, remedies there in terms of payment of three months rent to the tenant, including any damages, which would be attorney's fees, et cetera, for um, having to um, address that issue if, if they were kicked out. Um, so I think it's important to note that on the same night you declared an emergency, you implemented the first tool, which is really an anti-displacement tool. Um, you guys are really understood that this was really the next step and what was happening. Um, the other thing that Senate, uh, sorry, it's not Senate bill, but our ordinance did is that um, it does provide, so since then in, in 2019, um, the state passed Senate Bill 608, which is also a no cause eviction uh, uh, state law. Um, but ours requires 90 days instead of the 30 or 60 days that um, the state law required. And so we we um, consulted with the, the city attorney who also did some research with us. And we're recommending that we maintain our renter protections at this time because we do have those additional protections in place. Um, and the intent of these really, these protections were to ensure the health and safety and the welfare of our, of our residents. Um, with that, I just wanted to share a little bit of data to kind of show, this is data we've been reporting every time that we present this to council. Um, but I just wanted to show kind of how the region and uh, Milwaukee is trending. So uh, the top line is the blue line, that's region. And I do want to sort because I'm a data nerd that these are different data sources. So they're not necessarily apples to apples, but they are good sources that we've relied on for the last several years. So I think I just want to note that and just have people um, sort of understand kind of how they could really it shows kind of how Milwaukee has changed based on that data source and then how the region has changed based on census data. Um, you'll see that in 2016, we were really at the same point uh, literally as the, the region and we had a 3.7 vacancy rate. Um, and the region has trended up. So we're starting to see a lot more housing supply come on the market. Um, the reason why we collect the Milwaukee data is because it's more uh, localized and you can see there's a pretty big gap between what the region's doing and what is happening at the local level. Um, the regional data, as you probably well know, uh, accounts for all the housing supply that could come on in Hillsborough could change that. That doesn't necessarily um, directly impact us, though increases in housing supply at the region is definitely something that's a positive. Um, so I wanted to point that, that out. Um, additionally, I think um, the vacancy rate here has held steady. So while we've seen um, we've seen it really maintain a kind of this three, just under four percent level. So I would I would argue that um, I think that we still have a fairly um, constrained uh, vacancy uh, in the city, and that there is still is quite a bit of work to do to bring more um, supply in on in place. Um, the next slide I think shows I think a. A better story, but nonetheless, one that I think that we still need to pay really close attention to. So this is again based on census data, but looking at those who are severely rent burdened, so they pay more than 50% of their income towards uh, rent, and then those that are moderately, so that's those who are paying 30. And you can see the region is sort of trending the same, but ours has gone down. Um, I think there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but one thing I will point out is that um, that the city, when we implemented our housing ordinance in 2016, um, shortly thereafter, we took a number of steps. So the city has done things like adopted a housing strategy. We implemented a construction excise tax. We implemented a vertical housing tax zone, which I think was responsible for bringing in um, 100 units of housing in our downtown as a tool that's being used um, uh, on the uh, McFarland site right now. So um, those tools and strategies, I think, have made a difference in terms of the amount of supply that's coming onto the market. Um, and that I think that this indicator is also another one that we reported over the years. And I think one that we need to continue to pay attention to, but we still see that nearly one fifth of our residents are severely rent burdened and nearly half are still moderately rent burdened. Um, so I believe that we still have a great deal of work to do um, to uh, help our communities through this. So again, this has been, it's been four years um, since this has happened. And again, the primary reasons is that housing and incomes were not rising at the same level. That's true. We've seen modest increases in um, incomes in Milwaukee, but certainly not to run the pace um, with housing costs. 
Um, we've seen, you know, the increased rents that we saw at the time that we adopted this was 11.4% in Q25, and that's calmed down quite a bit. And as I mentioned earlier, that when we adopted this, um, the vacancy rate was 2.4%. So we've seen some improvement, um, but I, I would, I, I think staff is recommending at this point that we continue the housing emergency and we continue the renter protections, um, given that nearly half of our residents are still um, vulnerable. Um, with that, too, I do want to, the other a action we're asking today is to um, just make a, a minor modification to the ordinance um, for uh, the renter protection. And I just want to note that what we have drafted in the ordinance in attachment three is what's indicated up here. There was just a slight uh, translation error in, in the staff report. So I just want to note that what's in the ordinance is correct and that's what's up here. So what we're asking is, is that um, we change the uh, review period to align with the housing emergency. So that would be every six months. Currently the ordinance is written such that it would re we would reconsider it when the regional vacancy rate uh, rises above 4%. And so we, we check that every quarter. And so we have come back at times every quarter because of that or after one year so whatever comes first and so what staff is proposing and we discussed at our last council meeting um, was to just align those two together so every time we bring the housing emergency ordinance we will also be bringing uh, the the rental modification ordinance um, and i will note too that the data points that we have been tracking through the years are data points that we will continue to report um, to council and um, discuss in terms of you know, how long we should continue to pursue this. So with that, um, I do want to mention that in terms of the ordinance change, we are proposing this modification, but your alternatives are you can expire it and so not approve the uh, both the change or the resolution. And the other option too is you can revisit this renter protection measure in three months. And so you can um, reject that proposal that we have before you today. Um, so with that, what a staff is recommending is to approve the resolutions to extend the housing emergency and the renter protections and approve the ordinance that modifies ordinance 2118. Um, so that it's reconsidered every six months in alignment with the housing emergency. And so with that, I would be happy to entertain any questions. And I'll try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Okay. I have a few questions. Um, on the, I think the news on the severely rent burden is actually quite good. I knew it had trended down below the 25% uh, threshold a year or two ago, but I didn't realize that it continued to trend down, and that's great news. Um, I don't see how the vertical housing tax credit, which is going to very high-end homes, is likely to to credit for that. I guess, and I wanted I wanted a little more of your thinking on that. Oh well, forgive me. I wasn't suggesting that the the housing units that came online um, were income restricted or anything of that nature. What general theory is, is that it, it's, it's helpful in terms of increasing the supply across the board. And so by bringing in 110 units, um, we increased the, the supply capacity that we have in our city. So you're correct, there is not a correlation um, to that, but it is an important to note that the more housing that gets built, um, ultimately the better. Well, sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess um, at some point, yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. I mean, I get the market flow and the idea that it, it uh, affects availability at lower levels, but I thought you were attributing the reduction. I'd be, I'd be, yeah. It'd be nice to know sort of what that reduction is attributable to, but I don't know that we'll ever know. I suspect no. that some of it may be mathematical as we increase the number of people who are not rent burdened by bringing in people that can afford a higher mm -hmm. end apartment, mm -hmm. we may mathematically be seeing that change sure. occur, even mm -hmm. though life has not necessarily changed for the X number of people, people. who are renter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also may be losing some of those people. We definitely are. We know that from the school district data, there's a lot of displacement. Um, that's. I don't think that that is necessarily, the chart looks nice. I don't think it's good news.
we got another question. Well, I just feel like we've re-upped this for four years and we've never gone back and looked at the data and we've really never, I had asked for this 608, but I didn't, I got it, didn't have time to look at it by the time I got it. And I also had asked, uh, I also got today the um, link to the tapes of why we settled on the 4% and I haven't had a chance to go back and listen to those either. Um, but uh I guess I feel like I'm okay with extending this again. We obviously still are in a uh, in a uh, tight housing market, but um, I do feel like we should be taking a little more systematic look at some of this stuff um, and not just automatically re-upping it. And um, the the uh, slides that Layla used didn't acknowledge. I mean, I think she knows it, but it didn't wasn't reflected in the slides that this bill actually says no, no fault evictions after a year. Um, and yes, there are some exceptions to that, but um, really this bill should have cured the problem. Um, and so I'd like to have a little discussion about that and what, what we've learned in a year plus of having this bill and um, yeah. Anyway, so I would like before we come back in December to do this again, that we have a little bit more study and discussion of that. Yeah, I think we talked about this last time too, and that that we liked the uh, belts and suspenders approach. That you know we can control what we can control, and um, you know yes, we've got a, a you know a state law out there now, um, but so let's let's have that conversation, but. Yes, I think that's that's some of the reasoning. I don't. I mean, I, I think that I'd also like to see um, Layla next time we talk about this to make sure that you know we are taking. Um, we're not just looking at those those raw percentages because I do think that they can be a little bit deceiving. You know, when I look at what's happening in the market, you know, our our wages haven't necessarily gone up. But the rents sure have, and so have our home sales prices. We're now over four hundred thousand dollars median home sale price. You know the rents are are, and I'm looking at the Zillow numbers right now. They're they're right there. They're right under two thousand. Um, you know it, it, it's between eighteen hundred and two and twenty one hundred per month. Um, so it's. I, I think that we when we look at this and we're you know I'm, I'm not. I'm not convinced, you know, just to get, just to reiterate, I'm not convinced that we, you know, have um, resolved the problem simply because we, our number of severely rent burdened residents has, has gone down. Percentage of. Yeah, I would agree with that. You still have a quarter, 20% of your, of our people are severely rent burdened. And so I think these are great points. We'll have more information. Um, as we get further down the line, I can't wait for census data to come out because that will be very helpful. Um, but what staff can do is for our December discussion, or we can discuss whether or not to come a little sooner, is do a little bit more holistic look at um, these metrics and um, any others that council wants to uh, throw our way and give us some time to prepare to have a more uh, prepare to give you the information you need to have a more thorough conversation about this um, in advance of the next um, uh, time that this comes before you. I think it's a good time now to reflect on that. Um, that's why I pointed out that it's been four years. Um, so it's a good time to have, I think, a robust conversation and we'll do what we can to support you in that. Appreciate that. I actually have a related question. It doesn't exactly fit with what we're doing here, but it came up in my mind. Um, do we have any sense in Milwaukee of the situation for people who have been out of work for whatever it's been, two months, three months, and therefore have probably had a hard time making their rents? Um, do we have any sense of where that's at? Are our landlords forgiving? Are landlords do, doing any anything I don't personally know I think that um, we're still so early in this that again by the time we meet in December I think we'll have a little more information um, we can certainly discuss 
and with the county and the housing authority, what they're hearing and learning. So that can be a point that we will uh, look at and whatever we can find on that report back. I, I think probably anecdotally, um, you know, I mean, folks can't proceed with uh, evictions until I think it's, it's July 1st. Um, so folks are still in their place, but I, I don't know um, whether or not folks are able to make their rent or not. So you guys have that great resource page. And as I recall, there's a phone number or uh, some way for people to reach out to Christina with questions, um, or there was for Valeria, her predecessor. Are you getting calls? Um, not that I'm aware of. I think the, the calls we have been getting at this point have been primarily from businesses. Mm -hmm. um, calls that we do get, we do refer them directly to the county. And that is one thing Christine has done a wonderful job doing. I want to acknowledge a lot of the work she's done um, in tracking all the things that are happening with respect to rent assistance in particular. Um, so she's been really tracking closely what the county's doing. And then when we do get inquiries, um, she does refer those folks to the right people. Okay, any further discussion or questions? And I would entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the resolution extending the declared housing emergency for a period of six months pursuant to ordinance 2117. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the resolution extending the declared housing emergency for a period of six months pursuant to ordinance 2117. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None heard. It passes unanimously. Do you want to talk more about the next one or should we just? She treated them all together. Okay. Are you looking for a motion? Yeah. Yes, please. I move to approve the resolution maintaining the renter protection measures in Milwaukee Municipal Code 5.60 pursuant to Ordinance 2118. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the resolution maintaining the rent protection measure in Milwaukee Municipal Code 5.60 pursuant to Ordinance 2118. One eight. It's ready for the discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard. It passes unanimously. Do you want to say anything about this, Layla, before we make a motion? You good? You're good. Okay. Then I would entertain uh, another motion. Mr. Mayor, I'll just point out that we. Uh, did not post this in seven days before. So uh, when you, after you get through the first initial motion, um, staff will read it in its entirety. Ah, before we vote? After the first vote, but before the roll call vote. Okay, got it. I'll make move. a motion. I move for the adoption and the ordinance, excuse me. I move for the adoption of the ordinance, amending ordinance 2118 relating to renter protections and establishing a new code chapter 5.60 and declaring an emergency. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded for the adoption of the ordinance amending ordinance 2118 relating to renter protections and establishing new code chapter 5.60 and declaring an emergency. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard it passes unanimously. So is it Ms. Ober or? <laughs> it was uh, my error, so. So he has agreed to read it, which I really appreciate and I'll copy for. Pursuant to the Milwaukee City Charter, uh, failure to post seven days before a meeting requires a ordinance to be read in full once and then second time by title only if the vote is unanimous and council's vote was unanimous to date. <clears throat> An ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, amending ordinance 2118 relating to renter protections and establishing new code chapter 5.60 and declaring an emergency. Whereas Milwaukee Municipal Code chapter 5.60 governs the city's renter protections. 
And whereas the Milwaukee City Council has authority under ordinance number 2117 to take legislative action to provide adequate written notice of a no cause event of no cause evictions and whereas the Milwaukee City Council has declared a housing emergency due to low vacancy rates high rents and lack of affordable housing opportunities which must be renewed every six months and whereas the rental protections are enabled through the following emergency now therefore the city of Milwaukee does no, does ordain as follows section one section two of the ordinance 2118 is amended as shown in exhibit a read for the first time on June 2nd 2020 and moved to second reading by Five and a vote of the City Council. Exhibit A is Ordinance 2118 uh, amended, an ordinance of the City of Milwaukee, Oregon, related to renter protections establishing new code chapter 5.60, declaring an emergency. Whereas the Portland metropolitan region has the lowest residential vacancy rate in the nation as of the fourth quarter of 2015, estimated at 2.4%. And whereas the region's low vacancy rate has resulted in significant rent increases over the last several years, including a 11.3% yearly increase as, the fourth quarter of two, as of the fourth quarter of 2015. And whereas Milwaukee's proximity to Portland has resulted in increased gentrification and displacement of residents in recent years. And whereas the combination of high rents and low vacancy rates has resulted in heightened housing uncertainty for many Milwaukee residents. And whereas in recognition of the impact of low residential vacancy rates and increasing rents, the Milwaukee City Council has declared a housing emergency. And whereas the Milwaukee City Council has authority under ordinance to take legislative action to provide adequate written notice of no cause termination. And whereas the Residential Landlord and Tenant Act, ORS Chapter 90, allows for no cause terminations of month to month rental agreements with 30 days notice during the first year of attendance occupancy and with 60 days notice after the first year of occupancy. And whereas the Milwaukee City Council has determined that 30 or 60 days is not adequate time for displaced tenants to find and secure new rental housing. And whereas in order to provide tenants enough time to find a secure and new rental unit, minimum written notice of a new cost termination of tenancy should be 90 days. Now, therefore, the city of Milwaukee does ordain as follows. Section 1, a new chapter 5.60 is adopted and adds to the municipal code of Milwaukee, which will read as follows. 5.60, rent, Milwaukee renter assistant, Milwaukee renter additional protections. 5.60.010, purpose and intent. The purpose of this section is to provide residential renters in the city of Milwaukee with adequate protections in the event that they are served with a no cause eviction. 5.60.020 definitions act the residential landlord and tenant act codified in chapter 90 of the Oregon Revised statutes for the purpose purposes of chapter 5.60 capitalized terms have the meaning set forth in the act 5.60.030 applicability the following apply to tenants of dwelling units within the boundaries the city of Milwaukee, which are in addition to the requirements and protections set forth in the Act. A, a landlord may terminate a rental agreement without a cause specified in the Act, no cause eviction, only by delivering a written notice of termination to the tenant of A, of A not less than 90 days before the termination designated in that notice as calculated under the Act, or B, the time period designated in the rental agreement, which is whichever is longer. This requirement does not apply to rental agreements for week-to-week -week tenancies or to tenants that occupy the same dwelling unit as the landlord. B, a landlord that fails to comply with any of the requirements set forth in this section 5.60.030 shall be liable to the tenant for an amount up to three months rent, as well as actual damages, reasonable attorney fees and costs, collectively damages. Any tenant claiming to be aggrieved by a landlord's non-compliance with the foregoing as a cause of action in any court of competent jurisdiction for damages and such other remedies as may be appropriate. Section two will now read, the Milwaukee City Council shall reconsider the protections here in every six months, which is to coincide with the City Council's review of the housing emergency declaration. And section three, emergency, with increasing housing uncertainty and fear of homelessness for city residents, this ordinance is necessary for the immediate protection of public health, safety, and general welfare. Therefore, an emergency is declared to exist and this ordinance shall become effective upon the date of its adoption. And the second reading by title only, an ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, amending ordinance 2118 relating to render protections and establishing new code chapter 5.60 and declaring an emergency. Yes, sir. <laughs> the order of that uh, is number four. Councillor Heisey. Aye. The 
Councillor, how does he say hi? She did. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> should turn my volume back up. I can hear you all. Okay. Uh, Councillor Kirsten Faulkner. Hi. Hi. Councillor Beatty. Hi. Hi. Councillor Parks. Hi. Mayor Gamba. Hi. Motion carried five to zero, ordinance 2191. Well done. Woohoo. <laughs> Mayor, could we take a five minute break before we get into the public hearing? Absolutely. So we will recess the meeting for five minutes and then we will go immediately into the public hearing on the conference. Nobody on Zoom, hang up. Just mute no. yourself. And turn your, <laughs> don't hang up. Stay where you are. Just mute and turn your radio off.
Everyone at home ready? Okay. Mr. Mayor, we're back on the air. All right. The public hearing on the updated comprehensive plan is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to take public comment on the updated comprehensive plan. Does any council member wish to announce an actual or potential conflict of interest? No. Well okay. Uh, so we will have the staff report given by our senior planner, David Levitan. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councilors, David Levitan, senior planner, uh, presenting the staff report uh, for the proposed amendments to the comprehensive plan policy document, uh, file CPA-2019-001. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, Making your co-host, David, here you go. Yep. Is that showing now, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. So we are here tonight um, to for the council to conduct a public hearing on the planning commission's recommendation for the comprehensive plan policy document. Uh, tonight we'll be reviewing the process a bit and some of the changes that have occurred to the document since the council last reviewed it at a work session in December 2019. Uh, discuss the some of the public testimony that we received um, in advance of this hearing leading up right to before the hearing. Uh, take uh, public testimony both by Zoom um, and there in person in council chambers and then discuss next steps. Um, so just a little bit about the comp plan. I'm going to try to keep this brief because we've been over this a number of times, but the comp plan is the city's primary land use document uh, implemented through city ordinances and such as the zoning code as well as other programs. Um, the last major update was done back in 1989, uh, so about 30 years ago. Um, there have been a number of subsequent amendments for some of the moving forward Milwaukee work, some of the other uh, master and sub area plans that have occurred over the last 30 years, but there hasn't been a comprehensive update in a good long time. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a type five legislative amendment. Uh, so the Planning Commission conducted their own public hearings and then made a recommendation. That recommendation was for approval, um, which has now been forwarded to the city council for consideration of that recommendation. So what is being updated in the plan and what is not? So um, we, uh, the plan is uh, updating the introduction and background information, um, all of the goals and policies with the exception of the transportation section have been updated over the course of the past two years. Um, then a number of maps and graphics, uh, and then certain maps and graphics have been removed. Um, some of the park master plans are being removed from the document as well, um, eventually. And so, um, as I mentioned, what isn't being updated is the land use map at this point. Uh, we envision that over the course of the next few years, if there are any amendments to that, that would be done in concert with some of the code amendment work that um, is going to be done. And then, as I mentioned, the transportation section goals and policies are not being updated at this time. Um, the desire was to wait until a future update to the transportation system plan before we um, updated the transportation goals and policies. Uh, so a bit on the work plan for the project. Um, work started in fall of 2019, uh, sorry, fall of 2017. So a little bit over two years, about two and a half years actually now. Um, it was broken up into four blocks with policy work led by the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. Um, I just wanted to, before I forget, to just note the incredible commitment and the incredible work that the CPAC um, has done over the past two and a half years. Um, they led this process, um, the development of a lot of the policy language. I know a number of them um, will be testifying this evening or have provided written testimony and we've appreciated their effort and their commitment um, during this time. It wasn't easy to keep trudging along, but I just wanted to get that out there. Um, staff has met with 
council 19 times over the past two years of series of work sessions, including the four resolutions to pin down um, the blocks of work. Um, and then attachment four shows all of the changes that have been made to the policy language since the policies were pinned down by those resolutions. Um, so the last time that the council, I think, saw these were in December of 2019, um, right before we got into the Planning Commission public hearings. Um, so that attachment four, and I apologize, in the ori original packets, um, it didn't show up as track changes. Um, and so now they do. And so I just wanted to note that that was emailed to you separately. So don't be using the version that was in the original packet. Use the version that was updated subsequently and emailed subsequently. Um, so over the past two years, uh, we have tried to do a significant amount of community outreach and pub public engagement. This includes three town halls and two open houses. Uh, the most recent one back in August of 2019, before we got into the actual policy, the document production. Uh, we've had online open houses or surveys that ran concurrently or just after those in-person town halls and open houses. We met with the CPAC uh, 24 times, so basically monthly for two years. Um, we did several rounds of outreach to the Neighborhood District Association to discuss concepts such as the neighborhood hubs, to um, let them know where we were at as far as the production of the policy documents. Um, we held a number of focus groups um, with, with the Spanish speaking community, with some of our environmental organizations as we were working on some of the block three work. Um, and as I mentioned, we've held just a, a, a large number of work sessions, 13 with the planning commission and 19 with the city council. Um, so the Planning Commission public hearing um, opened on January 14th. That seems a while ago now. Um, and uh, there were actually five meetings. So there was public testimony taken on January 14th and January 28th. Deliberation started on January 28th, continued on February 11th, February 25th, and concluded on March 10th. Um, the major edits that the Planning Commission recommended to the document are summarized in attachment five of your packet. Um, and the Planning Commission did unanimously recommend approval um, of the document on March 10th. So just a little bit of a, a brief overview of some of the, the major changes uh, proposed by the Planning Commission. Um, policy 1.3.1, .1, um, which is the uh, calls for the creation of a community involvement advisory committee, um, basically something that's required by uh, statewide planning goal one. Um, th there were some early drafts of this policy that called uh, for the planning commission to serve in that role. Um, the planning commission recommended that uh, the council have more discretion and more um, uh, ability to appoint that committee and maintain that committee um, above and beyond just naming the Planning Commission in that role. Um, policy 1.2.5, um, there was a lot of discussion and I think you're gonna be hearing or you've read some testimony, especially from some of the CPAC members um, about a diversity, equity and inclusion committee, which is called out in the community vision that was adopted in late 2017. Um, originally there was a policy within section one community engagement that called that had similar language calling for the creation of a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Um, after some discussion internally, the desire was to not, given that that wasn't entirely a land use issue, um, was to instead uh, develop some language in a new policy that called for considering diversity, equity, and inclusion um, when basically as approval criteria for type four and type five land use applications. Um, so that's something that I know you're gonna be hearing about tonight and that's I would encourage the, the council to discuss. Um, and then there were several policies within, urban, within the section eight of the document, which is urban design. Um, we heard a lot of testimony from uh, stakeholders during the planning commission public hearings about um, issues of compatibility and adequate transition and accommodating infill development, which the city needs as a built out, you know, 
um, you know, in a ring suburb, um, but just wanting to make sure that um, there were adequate transitions to existing neighborhoods. So we've uh, incorporated some of that language into the Section 8 policies. Um, so as a comprehensive plan amendment, uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development, or DLCD, as well as Metro, our regional government, is required to review the document for consistency with the statewide planning goals, as well as Metro's urban growth management functional plan. Uh, so we sent those, we sent copies of the plan to, to DLCD and Metro in December of 2019 and revised versions in April of 2020. Um, the project findings, um, they are in attachment one, um, address compliance with uh, the functional plan and the statewide planning goals. Metro has submitted a letter of support um, and DLCD, is, DLCD has also indicated their support. So we feel like we've done a good job in, in meeting all of the statutory requirements at the local, regional and state level. Um, public comments received. So um, in attachment two and three, you'll find uh, the extensive public testimony that was provided both written and oral um, to the Planning Commission, um, both in advance of the January 14th and January 28th public hearings, and then at those hearings. Um, so we've included that within the packet and um, hope that you've been able to look through those. Um, and then in advance of these of this council hearing, we've received an additional 16 set of comments, uh, several of those in the last few days. Uh, four of those were received prior to May 17th, which was a deadline that we had set to be able to incorporate them into a matrix that includes staff responses. Um, and so that's included as attachment seven. Um, and then we've received over the course of the past, uh, approximately the past week, um, I think all 12 of the additional comment letters have come in. Um, those include um, letters from Reed CDC, um, an affordable housing provider, as well as the North Clackamas Watershed Council, um, whose executive director I know is uh, will be providing oral testimony this evening as well. So the agenda for tonight's public hearing um, is to take oral testimony um, and kind of see how that goes, how, how long that um, process is. Um, if we get through all of that, then for the council to begin discussion of public comments and, and uh, received, sorry, we'll be do, we will be beginning discussion of the public comments received and the preliminary responses from staff included in attachment seven. Um, and then we'd like council to provide feedback on any desired changes to the goals, policies, text and graphics, um, and then continue the public hearing to June 9th and resume deliberations. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions before we get on to the uh, public testimony. David, I um, I have I've been terrible at, at remembering how to unmute myself. I was going to enter when you were doing the um, talk about the outreach uh, that was done. I, I wanted to comment as well that most of those open houses town halls and um, surveys were all in the pilot as well. So there was outreach that way, which is, um, and, and using social media to announce those events. So there was a lot of effort to get people to those events and, and a lot of them were very well attended. So um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, but in particular, I wanted to call out the pilot because that is a source that reaches everybody at their door. So, thank you. Thank you for noting that. Questions? Can we uh, share the screen so I can see the rest of my council? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, this is not a question, but I, I don't really know where to put it. So I just wanted to acknowledge that this is David's last meeting and to thank him for so many hours of investment in community engagement. I know that you spent hours and hours talking with the public and really prioritized working with them and um, have really worked to make sure that we know what those conversations have been. and. Um, 
that matrix that staff put together that's in the packet of the public comments is truly, a, you know, it's like the ninth wonder of the world or something. That, that was a very, very good resource and I really appreciated that. Um, you know, I've watched the hearings and so on, but having the oral testimony actually transcribed and, and captured in a written form was invaluable. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for all that you've done for the city of Milwaukee while you've been here. and. Um, you know, have a great time in Seattle. I don't know why you'd want to move there, but you know, yeah. we'll all make mistakes. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Waited for the perfect time to move, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I appreciate the the kind words, Councilor Heise, and I would like to just note just the incredible efforts uh, of um, other city staff. Um, you know, we're soon to be retiring Planning Director Denny Egner, Assistant Planner Mary Heberling. Um, amongst others, uh, Community Development Director Leila Mon. Um, you know, going back just to a number of, you know, this is cross councils of the new planning commissioners that have jumped right on board. Um, and so I did want to thank everyone that's, you know, contributed to the effort. Yeah, I also wanted to uh, well, thank you, David, for sure, for guiding the CPAC through the past two years, um, but also to call out the Planning Commission. Um, there were 15 to 16 hours of meetings, four long nights, um, and, um, and it was led by a brand new Planning Commission Chair, uh, Robert Massey, who did a fabulous job. I thought he really did a great job shepherding things, but I also was just impressed by the really thoughtful detail back and forth that the, all the commissions commissioners gave to the um to looking at the policies so it was quite quite impressive yeah this is a team effort and a community effort it is indeed and i want to add my thanks david for you, all of your hard work and your great spirit and sense of humor that has kept it could have been a dry and painful ex two years uh, interesting and fun and uh, kept everyone coming back thank you mayor all right well if there are no further questions or accolades then i will move on to um have we received any additional correspondence on this topic and how do we want to handle that because i have seen that there's some emails come in that i have not gotten a chance to read. yes mr mayor if uh, i'm just double checking the inbox i'm unmuted right yeah we can hear you yeah okay um <clears throat> yes i i'm preparing a list and i'll read the names some of which mr mayor you're correct have come in since the work session started so um the correspondence staff has received since this was posted a week ago on Tuesday. We received from uh, Elvis Clark, Rennell Coburn, um, Ernesto Dominguez, Obama Flores from Reach, uh, Courtney Johnson, Stephen Lashbrook, Metro, Neil Schumann on behalf of the North Clackamas Watershed Council, uh, John Stoll, um, I'm forgetting the first name, but last name was Taylor, Marie Zelhari. And then since this meeting started, we had a comment uh, yeah, from Desi Nicodemus, Rebecca Hayes, and Ben Rousseau. And um, perhaps it could be read later that there was a person on the Zoom who commented in the chat. Um, she was here and then she reports in her comments in the chat that she couldn't stay on the line. So perhaps when we get to that point, we can read her statement into the record. But that is the list I have. David, do you have any others? Uh, no, so, and Scott, that was Celestina on the chat. She's actually at the protest right now. And so yeah. <laughs> make sure to get her words in before her phone died or was confiscated. So, <laughs> so I think we could probably, uh, I can, I'm prepared to read that, her statement until when we get to maybe after the in-person talking. Anyway, okay. that's the list that I know of. And so three of those you may not have seen because they came in since we've been here. All right, well, I suppose since we're not going to be making any decisions tonight, we'll have time to read those before we make decisions. So does anybody feel the need to take a break to read those before? Okay. All right, uh, good. Then 
Um, does anyone wish to make a comment on the proposed updated comprehensive plan? I assume all three of you do. And there's a and Mr. Rousseau, Ben Rousseau is downstairs. Okay. Um, I will recognize speakers and any questions should be addressed through me. When you begin to speak, state your name and city of residence for the record. For those who wish to testify, you may submit written comments by email to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. Staff will read those comments out loud. For those who wish to testify orally, orally. in Zoom, Zoom, or for those at City Hall, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Presentation times for all speakers will be limited. Representatives of groups will be limited to 10 minutes. Individuals will be limited. I think I'm going to say five because A, there's not that many of us and B, this is a complicated thing, and I think five is kind of a bare minimum. Um, so you have to reset the clock to five. I did. Okay. I'm on it. My new job. <laughs> awesome. You're one proud by Wilda. <laughs> <laughs> Please confine your remarks, proposed action, avoid repetition, and irrelevant information. Uh, in lieu of the yellow cards, I do have a list, and if I, if you don't mind, I'll just, it's sort of, it's not in any particular order, I don't think, but starting with the folks who are in the building. Yeah, uh, let's do that. And, and before we start, I want to add a personal note. I, I watched the um, Planning Commission hearings and uh, experienced a little frustration at moments uh, where people were... Um, Finding fault with the with the document with our our uh, comprehensive plan, but never or rarely giving specific points where they found the fault. There was a kind of a generality about the things that this document was going to do to the city of Milwaukee, but not a sense of we need eight point four point one changed to X or removed or. There was no specifics that would allow us then to consider that. Um, I think if people are holding out hope that we'll just trash all this two years worth of work and start over, they should give up on that concept. Um, so specificity uh, will uh, do you a lot more good than generality. All right. Uh, so I, I, you gave me the list, right? There's our. Well, that's list. the original list, but I've been building it, and then so. So why don't you just call them as you wish? Okay, hold on, just a minute. The first, we'll have Mr. Clark come up first, but before you come up, Mr. Clark, hold on. Then. I don't have my headphones on. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's not bad. So. Reasonably loud voice when you're standing by your head. Feel free to put your notes here if you like, and then between the speaker group, they do press the podium for my video. Hello, this is Clark. I live in Ardenwell neighborhood in Milwaukee. And I come here to oppose the uh, Section 7, the housing policy of the conference. And why? And also, before I start, um, I recognize that uh, single family zoning and racism have been mixed together in, in the past, but just hear me through. Uh, why do I oppose the Section 7 housing? Uh, part, uh, because there is a, no acknowledgement in the plan that there is likely to be adverse impacts on existing resident residents, either individually or as a whole, from a wave of new unit in bill, housing unit in bill. Uh, res one resident, Chris, uh, or I don't know how to pronounce his last name, tries to raise this point by suggesting additional safeguards. This is on page RS405 of the e-packet, the top row. 
with the plan, there's a respond that single family detached housing zoning is, is kind of an aberration or um, exclusionary. Uh, noting that, noting that there is no, no such zoning. But I would uh, argue you know, that um, this, this response ignores that developers were taken to using deed covenants in the past, still do in some areas, before zoning, to safeguard the nature of the neighborhood residents were buying their homes in. What is Matthew said, existing residents invest in the very nature of their immediate neighborhood. Zoning gives them an assurance to existing residents the openness, the openness of their surroundings will suddenly disappear with a wave of new infield uh, housing units. Uh, section 7. When you resume speaking, if you could try and hold still as possible, that would help. Uh, I'm having, I can hear you, but I, I have to focus to hear. I don't know that he heard my comment or that anyone did. That's better. Yep. is testing our, our equipment. <laughs> okay, try testing, yes. Oh, testing, testing. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. I think I left off with a section seven fails to address the balancing between uh, what existing residents are accustomed to. And my argument is that uh, involves the density part of the of the zoning and not so much who my neighbors are or who are not my neighbors. In fact, I have Afri uh, African ancestry uh, neighbors in a couple of different like single family homes right near me and an Asian gal uh, down the street and single family homes. So, it, you know, it doesn't really cut. Uh, they, they don't really care for infill either, I talked to them them and they actually come to me once in a while that they were worried about an increase in density or talking of if it became too uh, overwhelming they might move but uh so i the racial thing is you you a single family home neighborhood offer a um offer everybody um well the incomes are a part of it too but uh, you gotta be careful not to stereotype groups of people in one category of income. Not yeah, everybody's got an opportunity to get sleep there. Uh, you want to provide that opportunity to um, put everybody out. Um, so I'm uh, hoping that the uh, plan implement committee uh, led by Councilor Beatty will derive some kind of approach to 
incremental uh, approach to residential infield so that we kind of respect what existing residents have become accustomed to in terms of density and openness in yards and cars on the streets or not on the streets. And uh, the way that we might get with some of the policies like 7.22 mental housing and the median and low density area. And, uh, uh, keeping all the food all of these. So I just want to give those guys that are want to be respectful of neighbors that have been here all well, that have bought into the concept of the single family neighbor, but we're at, the, at the same time trying to recognize that it's kind of challenging. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, you. You seem to be suggesting that the um, single dwelling zoning isn't racist, um, but then you know that previously existing residents used to rely on restrictive covenants to protect the nature of the neighborhoods. Yeah. And so I just want to know if you're familiar with that history and if, and if you do know that those Oh yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> that specifically that those restrictions were race and the, and That might have been a function at one time, but and still it is, but in our area, I think we transition to a um, more inclusive concept than neighborhoods and, and the single families to deal with more about your general neighborhood and the uh, openness and the and, uh, cars on the street or not on the street and that kind of thing. And, um, I mean, we've had the civil rights laws passed since 60s, 70s, and there's, I mean, racism goes on forever. But, um, I, don't, I think you're using racism as an excuse to drive in the tension that went on here, and I object to that. It's not a brush of growth. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. substantially proposed before you, um, because I believe that it provides a, a solid foundation to implement much of the community vision to make uh, Milwaukee 
if you live a full, equitable, and sustainable city, and the fact is, you know, my hope is that the town plan will be able to endure and serve Milwaukee as well for quite some time to come. Uh, my personal measuring stick for that is that I, I hope it's something that could endure at least until the time that my toddler becomes an adult. Uh, and that toddler, as some of you know, uh, was not born when the, when the CPAC began its work. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that much of the, the challenge before you lies with weighing and balancing sometimes competing values and perspectives. This is messy and challenging uh, business. I, I don't see the position that you're in. Uh, you will likely keep your different opinions of whether specificity or flexibility is desirable for particular policies. It will likely depend on the specific intent uh, behind a particular policy. Where flexibility is appropriate, hopefully policies are phrased to provide a certain direction or floor for action without preventing a better version of that policy based on conditions that change over time. Uh, for instance, policy 7.3.8 allows for reduction in required off-street parking for new development within close proximity to the light rail station frequent bus service corridors. Given the cost of parking, uh, particularly structured parking, and the impact of the urban farm, I hope that reduction is broadly construed to allow, in some cases, reduction to the point of elimination, depending on the circumstance, especially if transit service and neighborhood amenities improve in an area over time. In other cases, flexibility and interpretation may become the Achilles heel of the policy. As an example, I'd like to echo written comments recently from President Ashbrook, urging caution about concepts like community character or compatibility of the um, I very much appreciate that there's an allure in these concepts, but they're also inherently subjective and will become the basis for subsequent fights about specific code provisions or development proposals. Uh, more specifically, I agree with Mr. Mr. Lashbrook that the proposed policy 8.1.4b for neighborhood hubs that says ensure new development is compatible with the height, massing, and building form of adjacent residential properties uh, risks crippling the implementation of the neighborhood hubs. Clearly, based on the use of uh, the phrase compatible and adjacent and the policy is written. If council wants to get at a similar concept, I think a much better model would be to look to the language in policy 7.4.5, uh, which uh, regards transition between areas of lower and higher residential density and some tools such as passing, buffering, and screening. I would also suggest that if uh, policy 8.1.4 be a revisited, might be better to focus the policy on the development code for neighborhood hubs rather than on the development of neighborhood hubs themselves, uh, which seems to presuppose a development review process for all. Lastly, I want to take a moment to address equity, particularly racial equity. Um, I want to say I'm heartened by the discussion and updates that I heard uh, earlier this evening. And as we heard from staff, the CPAC uh, recommended a comp plan policy for creation of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee that was grounded in a very clear policy statement that ended with community vision. Um, I believe that in order for the city to contribute toward dismantling systemic racism, it needs to institutionalize its commitment to promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. That includes embedding equity and policy, including um, providing for education and, and charging specific staff with the responsibility for making sure this is an ongoing priority for the city. But it also means empowering uh, community members in the decision making process. Um, and we can make a voice to black, indigenous, people of color, which are underrepresented in the city's power structure. Um, so while I'm sure the community is engaged in uh, equity efforts, and frankly, if those efforts lapse, it'll be helpful to count. Um, institutions are 
And I will also say that in my view, uh, perhaps because I'm trained as a geographer, uh, the comp plan effort, even upon approval, remains unfinished business until the city also updates the land use map. Can I ask you a question? Um, so Angel, we can't hear you. Yeah, if somebody's speaking. Are I you asking for a specific, um, specifically, is there an ask about the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, so I don't think this is necessarily a question about policy. What gives me concern is that only a few short months ago, some of the reasons cited for not including it in the conference and included things like concerns about the capacity of, of the city in terms of budget and staff, as well as whether it fit within the narrower scope of the conference. I, I can easily envision a future where uh, there are more competing constraints. And those are, those are very valid considerations. Uh, but I think it's important that the city at this juncture find a way to make a clear commitment to uh, implementing this committee provisions in the city's vision. Maybe that's in the comp plan, maybe that's outside of the comp plan, but uh, I hope that this isn't continually put off. Thank you. I have a question, and, um, and I'll ask the same question of Mr. Lashbrook if he testifies. Because um, I noticed his comment about 8.1.4b, 8 um, but I want to make sure you guys recognize that those were, there was 8.1.3 8 is hubs that are zone neighborhood mixed use. So when we talked about an 8.1.4 is other neighborhood hubs. So when we talked about the neighborhood hubs, you know, we didn't and on the CPAC and, um, you know, that was sort of a, um, you know, an unfinished conversation. Um, but what we did, definitely heard from the consultants was that we probably will be looking for a, a kind of a, a range of typologies of neighborhood hubs, right? And so some, will be neighborhood mixed use, which is what we have now in the zoning on 32nd Avenue and 42nd around the Safeway. Um, and others would be something smaller. So the one, the, the code language about that, that he objected to about compatibility with the height, massing, and building form of adjacent residential properties this is in the ones that aren't rezoned as neighborhood mixed use. So it's in the smaller, as it were, um, hubs. The language in the ones that are rezoned as neighborhood mixed use just calls for uh, some amount of um, you know, step back or some amount of buffer. Um, so does that change your thinking on, I mean, because we don't know what, what you know, how many hubs, there were 10 studied. I personally felt 10 was way too many, but um, there were 10 studied. We don't know how many are gonna shake out in which category, um, but I just wanna make sure you understood that there were two different categories and two different rules about the compatibility language. Mm -hmm. Hey, Gamba, Councillor Beatty, I, I appreciate uh, the note that you're making. I'm sure there. I, I will say that, in, in my view, the term compatibility invites disagreement and, and conflict down the road. And so the way to make that somehow specific to, to avoid those, those future conflicts, I think everybody will be better served. I mean, I think the, okay, fair enough. I think that's fair enough. I do think the, the idea that the, the heights would be heights being kind of the main issue would be uh, greater a lot more allowance for greater in, in a neighborhood mixed use zoned area than in an other area. And I, you know, we don't even know what that other area is going to look like. But um, anyway, okay. okay. Well, Kathy, did you have something? 
I did. It's. I just had a quick question, and and thank you um, for all your work, Dan, and for your testimony today. And uh, I think you also submitted some written testimony. My question is simply: Are you aware of any person of color in the city of Milwaukee who has requested a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee? So my recollection during the CPAC conversations, the representation of people of color voice support for the concept. But outside of that, I am not aware of specific people who have called for integration of such Thank you. Well, there any questions? Okay, thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? I am. Okay. Um, my name is Bill Corny. I'm at 3963 Southeast Lake Road. And um, I'm here to talk about the, uh, the zoning um, as a result of the conference and uh, that's been updated. And um, I have property in downtown Milwaukee in San Monroe Street. And um, um, on one side of the street, like next to the light rail tracks, there's three houses in a row that we have, and that makes it one acre of land. On the other side, we have the office building, and that is almost one make acre of land. Um, right now, the uh, the zoning on those properties are O and B, so the maximum number of, of uh, housing that they can put on those properties is thirty six units. And I believe I believe that it's higher and higher than that, so that we can get uh, uh, more people along the wide rail system. Um, because I'm I'm seeing cars, you know, during the daytime that are literally empty. So. Um, I know that uh, the planning commission of the planning process will be hiring a firm to uh, study how the zoning needs to be changed or should be changed if there's a comprehensive plan. And I would like to have my properties rezoned um, to a higher density. Um, and I, right now, I was thinking of the uh, downtown mixed use similar to what's in the whole downtown floor. Um, the old uh, more high density. Um, I'm not sure if that would ever fly um, because it might be too much for that street, for the middle street. Um, but that's something that the study has to determine. So I would like higher density and the professor mentioned now for the properties I own. Um, there are other areas on Washington Street next to the light rail station that also need um, to be changed. There's the, uh, the Amato building at the corner of and Washington Street, that also is on our own That too is considering how close it is to the light rail station. That should have a higher density. Um, again, you want to you know, some other part of the acre land. Then on the, across the street on 23rd Avenue, there are four properties there that are also Uh, my thoughts. 
everything so we add two job descriptions or uh, Mary, you're on mute. <laughs> did you have any? Did you have any questions of me, uh, uh, Bill? Okay. If you do, I can't hear when it's when I'm in person and have this in my ear. So wave frantically or something if you. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Very nice, Kathy. I'm trying to listen to Mr. Mayor for that, and uh, I'll note that Mr. Russo does not have an earpiece in him uh, on him. So um, <laughs> if somebody on Zoom has a question for him. I'll have to we'll really translate it. Okay. Okay. All right. um, before Mr. Russo begins, I just would say to Mr. Cordy, it's not a question, but just, you know, please stay tuned. What you're asking for rezoning is not what we're doing in the comp plan, but it is, as you said, you understood from the staff, the next phase. So stay tuned. There will be lots of opportunities to make your uh, request for rezoning. Uh, uh, there are uh, land use designations here that, that, that match the current so there is a conversation to be had here. So thank you for your testimony. Hello. Can you hear me? Can, I, can people on Zoom hear it? Yeah, they're nodding. Yes, they're nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So um, I submitted this today, um, some written testimony, and the people that want to be here are the person to answer any questions. Um, um, to answer any questions that may, uh, you may have. Um, just a lot of what I'm, I'm going to give you about today is um, that you'll be on Daniel. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, so, just to be clear, um, I have worked both on the Vision Advisory Committee and on the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee, and today I'm here representing myself. Let's see. So, um, definitely I want to give a lot of thanks for Council for involvement in the vision process, comprehensive plan process, and um, really making it happen in the city in a way that I haven't seen in other communities with the deep public outreach and uh, involvement in, in uh, the whole process all the way along. And, I mean, it's, it means a lot. It means a lot to live in a city that is conducted differently than it was conducted in this way. And very much um, and all of the involvement. And I know it's a common number. I think it's really complex. So that's, you know, very much what we need. So I also want to acknowledge that uh, there were hundreds of community members coming out to participate uh, in both the online survey and in the Share their concerns and their passions for the future of this study. And that was a really unique part of this process. Um, I think we picked up more of that envisioning because it was more like you know, imagining the future. But it was, um, it was really meaningful to, to listen to those things that really deeply mattered to people in the community. And then to go back and work really hard on trying to turn those into actionable strategies. And that's what we've been doing for the past three years, really. Deal with the whole process, and uh, I, I really believe that the community's voices were heard and were prioritized in writing the comprehensive plan. So we have to review right now. Uh, that has come from us really trying to distill what we've heard into. Um, so on that note, um, I would like to put my voice in support of the plan for all. Uh, I just have a uh, couple of points that I can make for potential. Uh, one, I don't have uh, support uh, the comments that were introduced by Stephen last year, um, which I believe I heard down the hall from Saudi Claudia that said uh, that uh, Daniel was speaking of that. Uh, specifically, just be, be cautious with the, the terms of compatibility and your character. And 
we have people who you have mining experience here, and so I know that you, you understand what that might be in terms of a conflict of challenges uh, and potential projects. And so um, when we're envisioning what we want to see for the future here, just you know, make sure that that language isn't going to be something that's moving forward. Um, and then the other point is I really want to um, look at the comprehensive plan. I ask you to look at the comprehensive plan as part of this, this land use document that is commonly referred to as. covers so much more than that. It covers arts and culture and, and uh, public outreach and um, so much more than just land use. And it's um, so. And in doing so, I really hope specifically that uh, you will support. Uh, community and support policies in the community that will help us really realize that goal of being entirely equitable. That is something that you know, a lot of people's passion has been in from the uh, vision process to be able to elevate that as a, as a priority for the city. And something that we don't do it here. We don't do it. If we don't address equity in a deep way, in a comprehensive plan, then where are we going to do it in a way that takes it past? It, it takes us past um, our current uh, elected officials and city and I have a question. Um, you offer a unique perspective uh, that through through marriage, you're part of the community of color, um, and you you recognize our commitment to that, having been on the vision committee and, and now on the compact committee. There have been good arguments on both sides of the idea of does the uh, does the existence of that committee need to reside in the comp plan or does it just need to exist? Um, there are, are arguments, almost no one is arguing that we shouldn't have that committee, I don't think. Um, but there are some well-spoken, well-thought-out people that believe it shouldn't reside in the comp plan. Our, many of our other committees, none of our other committees reside in the comp plan. Uh, so I would like your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I've actually um, backed away from uh, the thought that it has to be a standing public uh, committee. And it could be, I think that could definitely be the right, uh, right uh, mechanism to, to guide this forward. My 
problem is that we have allocated resources and authority from somebody. I think it, you know, it could be a well-trained and experienced uh, staff person who manages that, who has that authority and provides that guidance. Uh, I think probably ideally they would be engaging with a group of community members regularly, and that could be a standing committee that they manage. Um, but I'm not but, um, really asking specifically for that structure in the policy. I'm asking for for um, funds and authority to be able to guide us forward to get those uh, targets and keep us on track. So, given that we're now, you know, uh, finalizing our comp plan, do you, other than a, a general requirement that the city engage in that work, do you think there should be anything more specific in the comp plan regarding? So it's those three points. It's a commitment to set defining and uh, measuring and making sure that we're moving towards those, those goals and then the resources to do so. Okay. And one of those resources I'm specifically pointing out is um, ongoing training uh, to make sure that everybody's on the same page so they understand the implications of their actions and uh, the reason why this work is so important. Okay. So, but uh, I meant beyond those. <laughs> beyond those, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, that's, that's what I'm asking for right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've had a lot of discussion with this and not fine. I want to make sure that's really clear. Like in the comprehensive plan um, committee, we started discussion on it back in the uh, uh, work we were doing in the uh, economic uh, section. And then, and then uh, uh, we were going to cover that later, and then we, then we looked at housing. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll nail that down when we're looking at the, uh, the uh, synthesis that we're working on. And we talked about it, you know, we had conversations about this, and it was a public policy, and it wasn't. I don't believe we have a really good, a definite um, reason why not, except that it's a language document. And I believe it's the point of that. Is it just a language document? Is it, what does it come from? Uh, if that's, and I don't know. OK. So I, I really hope that you deliver it out. If it's not in this document, how are we? Visions are awesome. I love visions. It's something that's really important to have that kind of that most kind of that you're going going for. If you don't have the uh, resources and the mechanism in place to have and, and, and that constant focus going in that direction, you can never it's just a pretty uh, dragging the wall that eventually just frustrates people. Mark, I, I have a comment. Please, Kathy, go ahead. Um, I will have to, hang on, hang on. How, how do we do this? <laughs> is there something wrong? Oh. Is there a reason we're not using yeah, the just raised hand in? Working on this. I think I just Did you zone? Well, I unplug one? I'm not sure that Mark would have seen the raised hand, Wilda. Scott might have seen that. Scott might, but if there's a facilitator to watch for it, that's the important thing. I really enjoyed Councillor Heisey's swinging her arms around wildly there for a minute. Yes, that was interesting. Was helpful. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what she was trying to do. Okay, so Ben, you can hear now. Okay, okay. Ben can okay. hear you. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, Ben, as we figure out how to navigate in these times. Um, I appreciate your flexibility uh, around thinking about this. Um, my sense is that the, the comp plan has some very legal reasons that it's focused on land use. And I have appreciated watching the evolution of this document to include in the policy goals in more and more ways, um, indications of Milwaukee's commitment to equity and inclusion and justice. And I, um, 
I actually am somewhat uneasy with a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee because I have seen the wasteland of DEI communities that has been spreading across corporate America since the mid 90s. Um, and, and I feel like there is a real potential there for it to feel like this represents some sort of commitment and um, and for that to fall away. I, I don't actually get a sense of security from that. What I do get a sense of security from is, I, I mean, I think that this should be a council goal going forward and that gets all of those things that you mention in those bullet points. It gets us the funding that we need to do the work that will appropriate will actually affect culture change it gets us the resources to really engage with our communities of color and ask them how can we best help um, we heard testimony or we had written testimony uh, earlier today that was asking for an investment in black and brown communities we could do this one of the ways we could do that would be to rather than having a traditional milwaukee committee that is appointed um, would be to hire a handful of individuals of color who are experts who can help guide us through this process that's just one example um, but i'm i am actually leery of continuing to depend on committees as the tool that we think will get us an outcome and and i don't actually believe that just because we appoint a committee or we say that there's going to be a committee in our comp plan that gets us there at all it, it gives me no sense of security it actually makes me uneasy it, it it externalizes something that i think we all need to take personal responsibility for and i'm happy to make that commitment myself um, and i think the rest of us are as well um, so I just wanted to, I don't know, there's something about the way Mark said that that kind of set me off. I had to get that off my chest. <laughs> um, but I, and I do see flexibility in, in the points that you've brought up in your written testimony and, and what you just said to, um, to think further about how else can we, how else can we better incorporate our commitment to equity, inclusion, and justice in the land use document that is the comp plan because we've already talked extensively about the fact that land use does have very clear um, history as being a, a bludgeon for racism and um, I, I just thank you for the thought you put into that experience uh, knowing Mm -hmm. And and you, I think it's you are the first person I've really heard articulate um, that there could be another way forward. So thank you. <laughs> I actually have a question. If it's all right for me to jump in for one minute, um, I, I I'm going to be honest. I only sort of heard uh, some of your terminology, Ben. I'm going to go back and read it after this just to make sure I fully understand it coming into next week's meeting, um, but. I think that there's a delicate balance in the language I did hear. And what I heard was we need to measure and we need to know and we need to present. And, and those are all things that are perfect in a comp plan. Um, I get cautious when we define money in a comp plan because that's a budget document. It's different. But I think you get there if you say that those three things need to happen. Does that make sense? So if you define that I have to create those things, then I have to get it somehow. Whether I pay for it, I create it through staff. Those things come, but that is that is just a tweak in the terminology that I'm gonna be, I'll be bringing up with council tonight. I didn't want you to go home and not hear it directly from me. Uh, that I, um, that I That's the difference for me, is making sure that we keep it focused, but I think you get the outcome you're looking for, and I think we can get to language without tying it to budget. Does that work? 
or at least do you hear me on that? I guess is probably the better question. Well, and I think you make it a requirement. I'm not actually lessening that language. I think you make it a requirement in the language. It's just, and resources can be a lot of things. They can be financial, but they also can be staff resources. So I'm okay with terminology around resources. And like I said, I wasn't sure I heard you perfectly correct. So I'm gonna go back and read this. Um, but I just wanna make sure we're cautious about time budget. Perfect, thank you, everyone. Will, did you have any questions? You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> no, I have no questions. I think Ben articulated quite well on the questions you've asked were good ones. So I'm fine. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do. Is there anybody else? Um, Mr. Schulman is on Zoom, and I went. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for everybody helping me navigate Zoom technology, <laughs> and I hope, assume that somebody will wave if you can't hear me, or I'm still muted, or something like that. Um, I wanted to, I will keep this brief. Um, I think I'm, you know, you've received our, the written comments from the North Clackamas Watersheds Council. And for the record, we are at uh, 2416 Southeast Lake Road. Uh, we support this plan. We uh, hope that you will vote yes. Um, we believe this is, plan goes a very long way to creating the, <clears throat> a healthy environment for fish and wildlife and people throughout Milwaukee well into the future. There's a couple of things about, you know, obviously a lot of the details will be figured out during the policies, plans, and zoning maps and implementation and creation of programs. And we look forward to participating in that. We also think that in our experience where the city of Milwaukee leads, other communities in North Clackamas County tend to follow. So I think we, will hopefully eventually start to see ripple effects. And because so many of the watershed issues that affect Milwaukee happen in areas outside of Milwaukee, the intergovernmental collaboration part is particularly significant. There's a couple of things I really, we really did appreciate about the plan that are worth pointing out very briefly. The biggest one is recognition of the connection of uplands to streams and how our streams function. That is never a process that you can solve at the stream. It's always a process you really have to think about the uplands and the hydrologic connection between the floodplains and the impervious surface and land use. The other one is the recognition of both the need to reduce climate um, climate change and the pace of it as best we can, but also to mitigate for the impacts that we're already seeing in terms of things like late season water avail availability, increased potential for increased flooding, movement of species, uh, and the impacts on water quality. A um, couple of other things that stand out, obviously we have been working in partnership with the city for a long time and will continue to do so to establish a free flowing Kellogg Creek and remove Kellogg Dam. And uh, those efforts are ongoing and Obviously, the city has been helping lead that process. Uh, the other thing that I was glad to hear after our initial comments um, was we really strongly support the need for a healthy urban forest and the goal of a 40% urban tree canopy. The, um, I had heard that since we submitted our comments that the plan tree inventory work is back in the budget, either that or I mistakenly thought it was out, but I'm very glad to see that. 
and we look forward to seeing that move forward. We know we can't provide a tree canopy without on, on public land alone. So we know it's important that this that that there's strong measures in place. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The other thing that I do want to really say is significant is the inclusion of policy 8.1.9b, protecting a tree creek's natural area and its adjacent riparian areas. That is a regionally significant natural area that frankly has vast unrealized potential, both from a watershed health and floodplain standpoint, but also as a publicly accessible natural area that shares a parking lot with a community college and an aquatic center. And kind of, we look forward to kind of joint planning for the future of Three Creeks with Wes and NCPRD and the council as things move forward. Um, obviously, the inter-jurisdictional nature of this work is critical. That is not something, obviously, the city of Milwaukee can't put in the comp plan what the city of Happy Valley or Clackamas County is going to do. But those are really critical things that ultimately will need to be addressed through multiple processes involving those eight, those other jurisdictions. And the plan rightly calls out the need to prioritize working across those boundaries. Um, obviously, that's an investment in staff time and political capital, but I'm delighted that that's in there. Um, it is also impossible for me to talk about this without the outside of the context of what's been in the news for the last last bit, and one of those is coronavirus, and the other one is the uh, racial injustice that um, cities around the, the country have been responding to. Uh, both of those just obviously disproportionately affect low-income people and people of color. And one of the things I wanted to point out as a model that could be applied elsewhere is what is in the language re related to the urban forestry section, which is... Um, that uh, is the prioritization of communities that are low income and communities of color in where the where the tree tree establishment is prioritized. Um, and trees have a huge health a huge health impact in terms of things like they correlate with lower rates of asthma. Low income communities and communities of color tend to live in areas with higher diesel particulates that makes them more vulnerable. That has been obviously making those populations more vulnerable to COVID. They all, the, same, the same filter or lens can be applied to where do we establish new trails? Where do we establish new, area, new um, natural areas that are the priorities for public access? Uh, where do we, bioswales just like trees should not be something that we accidentally or unintentionally only find in the more well-to-do communities or in the center of town. Um, so I think that we have an opportunity to, I think, strengthen the plan in general by applying some of that policy language to all of the other natural resource sections of this plan. Um, but I wanted to thank the city for all of this work. It's been a pleasure to be part of. Um, Disappointed that David is going to Seattle. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with him and with all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Any questions for Neil? I, I had one. Um, I'm glad you're here. It's it's actually not related to your testimony, but I had this moment when I was reading through uh, the second or third time, and I thought, oh, yeah. say that again. A little. Extra. I'll, I'll slow down my speech. Um, when I was doing another pass through the comp plan, I had this moment where I thought, all we talk about is fish and wildlife habitat. What about pollinators? What about plants, et cetera, so on and so forth. Um, do you feel like those are captured effectively enough in the conversation around ecosystems and habitats um, and the need to protect and enhance those or do we need to call those do we need to call insects and other living creatures and plants out independently i think there are two things that i think address that as 
reasonably well and those are one of them is the emphasis on habitat but also the but also the emphasis on connectivity and there is language in um in here to that it's you know you preserve all of those species not just by by not having little isolated postage stamps that right. um other wildlife aside from a fish that's going to swim is going to be able to go from a to b to c uh, there is the uh, connectivity working group that is housed out of the Metro uh, Parks and Nature Department that is basically developing those guidelines for different habitat types. And that is the second part in that um, it's worth articulating in the um, in the at the policy level, I would say that um you know that we don't want to just restore douglas fir forest in the city of milwaukee we also want wetland habitat oak woodland um maybe we restore some prairie habitat from time to time um those are um and uh you know three creeks is actually a perfect example of a natural area that has about four different four to five different habitat types in it that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, I, I just needed a little help in um, how to think through that. So I appreciate it. Anybody else? Any other questions? Linda? All righty. Uh, any, oh, do you want to read uh, the ones? Um, I, before we go to the one I'll read, um, I had received an email from Stefan Lashbrook, and I see that there's a Lisa who's raised their hand. So I'm going to allow that Lisa to talk. Oops, I got the wrong one. I'll, I'll say I'm going to go to Lisa if it keeps moving around. I'll have a talk. Lisa? This isn't Lisa Lashbrook. Really, it, really, it really is Lisa Lashbrook. This is, uh, I'm sorry, my computer refused to load the new Zoom program. Um, and so I'm using Lisa's and I have to say her computer has a reputation for just kicking us off the internet altogether. So that could happen at any moment. But if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll say some things. Thank you, you. you. You've been relabeled, Steph, and we know it's you now. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I, I'm going to start with uh, Councillor Heisey's uh, comments earlier, partly because I thought uh, Mr. Shulman addressed some things in a much better way than I could. And that goes to viewing this entire document as exclusively a land use plan. It really isn't. Um, and I think planners, planning commissioners, and even people at DLCD have gradually over the last 50 years thought of it more and more as just being a land use process. And it was never intended to be that originally. When you think about goals that deal with economy and public facilities and transportation and air quality and water quality, that's all, sure, there are land use implications in there, but it goes way past that. So um, I'm, I feel, I've been beating my head against this for 50 years for so, some of my frustrations coming out, but. I apologize for that. So you've got my written comments. I just, I wanna add a couple things just uh, this evening. Um, and I'll start with the, the standard, uh, I, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, anything from CPAC or from my work with Lou Elling NDA. Uh, and I thank you for considering my testimony and everybody's testimony, because I know what you've been up against uh, just inundated uh with all kinds of things and i thank you for taking that time and, and doing that work what i want to focus on tonight uh, has to do with density issues and public involvement um, and i'll say that an awful lot of my concerns about public involvement you addressed earlier in the meeting before you ever got to the comp plan and i really appreciate what was said and the various people who spoke but um, when I think about density issues and public involvement, I invariably come back to the word prejudice. Um, 
it's a strong word, but it's an important one, when you, especially when you look at what's going on in our country right now. Uh, because, uh, so, you know, okay, what's the connection with the comp plan? You know very well, it's been talked about tonight, that our past land use practices and many of those that continue, um, not just here, but everywhere in the country, have served to separate people based on class and often based on color. We can begin to change those practices and a lot of the things included in this plan are headed in that direction. Um, still, I feel the city needs to do everything it can to invite everyone to in the community to be more involved in the decisions that affect us all. And in my mind, that goes way past land use. I'll step back from it and say, no, that doesn't mean it absolutely has to be in the comp plan. But right now, that's, this is the opportunity. Um, and certainly it could end up a different committee, some other form that I can't even envision. Um, all that's fine. I think, I think you now have the momentum headed in that direction. So I'm going to step back to my comments about density and people's fears about density. Um, I actually don't think that Milwaukee's low density neighborhoods are going to undergo some huge change as a result of this document. And there are two main reasons for that. There's some other ones, but two main reasons. The first one is that most of the existing house, housing stock in the city, the single family housing stock, is now too valuable to tear it down and replace it with a duplex or a triplex. Um, our house, so some of you have been in our house, it's in the mid-1950s, it's fairly modest. Still, it would not pencil out to replace this house with a duplex or a triplex or even a fourplex. So I just don't see that happening. The other thing is that this property, as with many in Milwaukee, has the kind of deed restrictions that Mr. Clark referred to uh, that don't allow uh, increases in density. Will those deed restrictions go away at some point in the future? I hope so, but I don't know that they will. And right now, uh, they really do prevent a lot of those changes. Um, obviously not everywhere and not every subdivision has the same deed restrictions, um, but certainly a lot of them do and they were all crafted in the 40s and 50s. Um, so many people fear change and increases in density especially trigger those kind of fears. But my own experience about it tells me that the things that are wrong with multifamily development and that cause people to say they're a terrible thing to have are one, they tend to be poorly designed, two, they're not sufficiently maintained, or three, they're just not well managed. And the last two follow the first one. If a, if a development is poorly designed, it's not surprising that the landlords will not put in the investment for maintenance and management to keep it um, or to make it something better than the design would have allowed. Um, and those things lead to the kind of prejudices that people have about it. I mean, there's also the whole element of, well, we don't like the kind of people who live there, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I've been one of those people, I'm related to many of those people, and I just can't go there. We can put rules in place to deal with design, property maintenance, and property management. The, the public participation seems like a way to give more people the opportunity to work through their prejudices, if ever they will. I think our country's imploding right now and every possible prejudice is at play out there. So I think this is a time to do a lot of the things you are already doing, things you talked about earlier in your meeting tonight. Um, and I, you know, I've said this to you before, I've worked for lots of jurisdictions over 50 years and um, Milwaukee does a great job with public outreach. It really does. Uh, is there more that can be done? I think so. Uh, that's not to say it's that anybody else is doing it better. Um, I'll end by saying I really appreciated uh, uh, Ben's support for my concern about uh, neighborhood hubs. So much work has gone into that, and it's still just scratching the surface. We don't know what they're going to look like. We don't know exactly where they're going to be or how big they're going to be. But if we don't leave that open, if we close those doors now, developers will never step in and, and do anything with them, especially in a neighborhood like ours in Llewellyn. 
So uh, I'll leave it at that. I, I join everybody else in thanking you for all your hard work. Um, I don't make light of it. Uh, I really don't. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Uh, did you want to ask your question? No. Really? You don't want it from the horse's mouth? <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. Well, I've lost my... Hold on, Stefan. Okay. So, I asked this... You're, you're muted. Oh. It's 8.1.4, I think. Oh, not like one. I'm just trying to take out my... I asked this of... Um, of Daniel Eisenbeis because he seconded your comment, but on your comment about the compatibility in the neighborhood hubs, you were there are two sections. So one is um, eight point one point two, um, which is about uh, oh I'm sorry eight point one point three which is neighborhood mixed use zones. So some of our hubs are already neighborhood mixed use zones on 32nd and on 42nd. Some of our future hubs may be uh, rezoned as neighborhood, as, uh, as neighborhood mixed use zones. And so that has a different language about um, impacts to the neighborhoods, but not compatibility with the neighborhoods. The compatibility language is only in the, the thing for neighborhood hubs other than neighborhood mixed use zones. So does any of that change any of your thinking? Uh, I, I'm not sure if you can hear me now, but um, my, my, my response is probably not, but I would like to leave that door open. I'd like to ponder that between now and next week, and I, I won't wait till next Tuesday to answer your question, but I still think the language is dangerous, even, even though if it were designated a neighborhood agencies have that would tend to alleviate most of that concern, I still think that kind of language is dangerous. But let me, let me I'll dig into it more and I'll, I'll get back to you. Anybody else have a question, Kathy or uh, Wilda? All right. Thank you, David. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. All right. Uh, so, do you want to read? Okay. So this this is a testimony submitted uh, via the Zoom webinar chat, which I have taken down for the record. But this is from Celestina DeMuro. And uh, the I'll read it verbatim, but the beginning is talking about what happened, why she couldn't stay. She says, I've been carrying y'all around in my pocket with headphones in while I march in downtown Portland for the end of police brutality against racism and racial injustices and for the rest of all four Minneapolis police officers involved in the murder of George Floyd, waiting for the public testimony for the comp plan, comprehensive plan. Unfortunately, my phone is almost out of battery. I was not able to submit written testimony prior to tonight's meeting, regrettably. However, I would like to one, echo Stefan Lashbrook's written testimony, and two, reiterate, reiterate the city's once, re, reiterate to the city once more that a diversity, equity, and inclusion body must be established at the city of Milwaukee, and that must be specified in the comprehensive plan. The national moment seems to illustrate this need more than ever than I ever could, and I imagine the photo that will surface in the next 24 hours of hundreds of us lying face down on Portland's Burnside Bridge for nine minutes in honor of George Floyd and all those who've been murdered out of racism will illustrate. That is my testimony, testimony tonight, Celestina. And that, Mr. Mayor, I believe, looking at the inbox and watching for any other raised hands, that is all the testimony I am aware of. This is Anne. There is one other comment that I just want to call out here uh, because it wasn't called out prior. Uh, e did make a comment later in the testimony that he did request through the leadership program a um, DEI committee. So I just want to, and he also offered to serve on that committee. So that was in response to Councillor Heisey's question. Thank you.
All right. Can I, sorry, can I just know that there is one person raising their hand now? Scott. Yep, I see it now. Um, Becky, Oregon Becky. Oh yeah, Becky said she was. Allowed to talk. Is this, uh, could you state your name for the record? Uh, yes, uh, Rebecca, AKA Becky Hayes. Okay. And uh, I'm living currently in Woodburn on Evergreen Road. I was formerly from uh, Southeast 26th Avenue. I, <laughs> okay. I have been, uh, I've had the honor of being on the uh, Comprehensive Planning Advisory Committee for the last two and a half years. And prior to that, I joined in the vision, visioning statements. I have five generations of my family living in or out of Milwaukee at one time or another. Most of them, I still have two generations left. I was displaced <laughs> during, um, the, um, I'm sorry, um, I live just a few blocks from Letting Library and I love being able to walk downtown and enjoy the beautiful atmosphere and the friendly people. During this process, as the high cost of living increased substantially, I was forced to relocate and sincerely hope to come back to Milwaukee in the future. I believe the current documents support many areas that will allow for growth and still allow for those who want to age in place. I have hope, a lot of hope for Milwaukee and uh, with the creation of the comp plan, um, I strongly endorse it. That's for me personally. Um, it's been an enrichment for myself and also, I'd like to touch on the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I listened to Counselor Hayes and her comments, uh, along with Ben's, because I've been watching this all the time. And I kind of agree that maybe a committee is not the answer, but I think the solution has to be inclusive for the diversity, equity, inclusion, and including those of all ages and all abilities. There is uh, some prejudice in that area too. I know right now it's the color issue, uh, national issue, and that's been a long going, uh, over 400 years. So I don't downplay that one bit, but as aging and people with different abilities, we need to look at those two. I, see it throughout the comp plan revision and I'm very proud of my input in that. There's many changes and challenges we for we face over the last few years and we can look forward to many more ahead. The ability to allow flexibility in a mixed density area, housing options and adaptive reuse of buildings for the citizens of Milwaukee is necessary. The ability to scale up and scale down people as people age, it's essential for more housing options on the scale of affordability. This I can relate to personally. On policy 12.4.3, it states ensuring that an expectation programs respect community identity how do you do that without making a prerequisite to an expectation? I think it would be more advantageous to focus on adaptable adaptation and change rather than have a requirement. During the last three years, I have often referred to AARP's livability community models and asked that the city of Milwaukee perpetuate injustice and to move toward an age-friendly city in Oregon. Thank you for listening. Thank you all for allowing me to participate. I'm so proud to be part of you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Any questions? No? 
any any others? Mary, you seeing anything? No. Okay. You know, if somebody if somebody does come in um, before we close, they think we have a chance for questions. Let's go ahead and take them. Oh, well, I that actually, I, I need to raise a few things because um, I, I did hear that from a few different people that they would like to provide some testimony after tonight. And so my preference would be to... Well, we're not going to close public testimony. Like... To, I mean, until I'm... So I'm looking for the option. So my question is about continuing public testimony. I'm getting Same. feedback. <laughs> Continuing public testimony until June 9th. That would be my preference. I've heard okay. from Dr. Zapata at PSU. Um, I've heard from the president of uh, um, Housing Land Advocates. Um, I believe AAP also uh, is, is, is writing a letter. Um, and so I think that those are very valuable. Um, Right. There were um, some emails that we all didn't have an opportunity to read yet. That the testimony might be has no. There has been no testimony come in. The emails. Well, there's there are some new emails that we all of us haven't had a chance to read. Everybody yeah. hasn't had a chance to read them. Correct. Right. So I, I I agree that we should keep public testimony open. I just thought we would close it and then open it at the next meeting. Is that not what we need to do? My understanding is you just motion to continue the date too, and then it just stays open. Okay. All right. So let's. If uh, Justin or Danny want to object to that, <laughs> but that's my understanding of how the script was set up. Okay. I'm just one motion to continue if you're finished this evening. When, um, you're, when you're finished this evening. Yeah. Uh, this, Scott. Okay. Thanks. Um, does staff have any response to the testimony we've heard tonight? Let me, can I comment on the process for a second? I mean, you, you could, since this is legislative, you could close testimony for tonight and, and have some deliberation tonight if you wish to, and then reopen the hearing next time. You know, you don't, you don't need to close it for good. Um, so that, you're it's totally flexible in that sense. That's what I was thinking, and, and the reason why I think that might be useful in this moment is I think all of us probably have notes of things that we want to bring up. I think people will feel cheated if they don't have an opportunity to respond to the things that we're bringing up. So I would like an opportunity for council to be able to at least go through some of our notes, some of the maybe they hit the big, big marks. Um, so that if there are things that are upsetting to people, they have a chance to come in in one of the next two weeks. So that's what I, I thought that that was the way it could work, Denny. So, yeah, you, um, you'll continue. To, you'll continue the hearing at the at the end yeah. of the evening. But um, you could close the testimony for tonight and begin deliberation. Right. Okay. So before we do that. Does, does staff have response to any of the testimony we heard tonight? Uh, Mayor, I would just note on the, there's already been some discussion of the neighborhood hubs, but I would um, kind of support what Councillor Beatty had noted as far as kind of the differentiation between the neighborhood mixed use zone hubs and the non-neighborhood mixed use hubs. So non-neighborhood mixed use zones hubs. Um, I think the, you know, if we need to soften the language or revise the language, if there are concerns about terms such as compatibility, um, I think it was mostly about when you have just a couple of properties that are within a primarily residential neighborhood, um, you know, how big and how large and in bulk and scale should these things be. Um, you know, all of our zones currently allowed to go up to two and a half stories or 35 feet. So even if you're relatively compatible with those, um, you're still going to be able to have a relatively large building. Um, you know, whether that needs to be softened, would it be problematic to have a three-story building next to 
a zone that allows for two and a half is currently um, we can discuss that I think we would get into those details within the code work it really you don't need to hash that out within the plan but if there are verbs or adjectives that need to, you know that the council feels um, should be revised to reflect that and where the policy direction might be going um, we would be open to that it's yeah. unlikely it's unlikely we will, we will have code language that would include the word compatibility um, the, that is just the policy direction for how we craft the code language in terms of those sites that are the sort of scattered sites that are not currently designated um, as a, as a neighborhood mixed use area we have two we what what you will see in the next um, I don't know month or so is the sort of a final report on the hubs which will essentially be used for the implementation component and in that it describes the typologies in a little more detail but there's the the types of hubs that go in the neighborhood mixed use areas there are hubs that basically are currently zoned for commercial uses that we will probably like the CL zone and the NC zone my preconceived notion is those zones go away and they're replaced by either NMU or a hub zone and then there's the hub that might be a conditional use in a residential area so they're like three different types of hubs that we still might be considering um, that's down the road a bit um, I one of the things I've done even I think before Stefan was even done talking is I sent him an email um, saying let's talk about this <laughs> and we can uh, um, kind of because I wanted to explain to him kind of what's evolved since the last time he's seen it okay any other comments I have a question of staff um, probably for Justin and it has to do uh, with deeds, deed restrictions. So if, if laws change, if zones change, do those or do those not trump deed restrictions? Um, good question. Uh, I'll have to give it some thought. My, my uh, initial thought is that unless a deed restriction is found to be illegal for some reason uh, that it would not be trumped by a zone change because it's a matter of record that's tied to the property but that's just my initial thought I, i'll give it some more thought mayor i think it would be really useful to have some assessment of how much of that we really have um yeah because I, I think you're probably right that you know it's one thing for the racial covenants which were found unconstitutional but covenants that restrict size I'm not sure they're going to be found from and I would love to know how prevalent that is yeah I, I, I have uh, no idea how uh, peppered with restrictive covenants uh our neighborhoods are i have no idea well an idea of real assessment is, is a big undertaking but it would be useful to maybe just cherry pick sure 15 properties in the in the in that next week and just see um since Stefan volunteered that his is one we could start there but i mean be interesting to know and tip, typically deed restrictions at least historically uh, I would it would be my thought that they're typically reciprocal so you've got a group of people maybe their houses were built around the same time or uh, a large parcel with a farmhouse on it that gets subdivided and people buy the lots that farmer who subdivided his lots in order to sell them he might require a deed restriction so that whoever comes in is restricted in some way size or uh, setbacks or 
any one of a number of things that could have historically been relevant at the time. We, Justin, Justin, we might reach out, out to DLCD, DLCD um, because this, this question is definitely coming up quite a bit in the context of rulemaking for HB 2001. It's sure. more about, um, you know, folks passing deed restrictions to try to sort of get, a, get a, you know, get in front of 2001 implementation. Um, sure. I think that's obviously a little bit different and probably a little bit more challenged since the rules of the law is already on the book. Um, but in any event, there might be a lot of research and land use laws that you might take advantage of rather than trying to reinvent any wheels. Yeah, I remember back when 2001 was, was I, I remember reading a position paper on that and I just can't recall any of the conclusions as I stand here this evening, but uh, it seemed to me that the fear was pretty remote of, some, of, of somebody being able to do that. Um, uh, but I, I'll see if I can dig that up. And counselors, I would note that my, my recollection and my understanding when House Bill 2001 was passed was that the, the legislature knew that the deed restrictions would not be superseded by either local or state actions, and that's why they prohibited them and, and covenants and deed restrictions in the future could not be that's part of the language within House Bill 2001 that no new deed restrictions and covenants can be put in place to limit middle housing options, but they basically acknowledged that there wasn't a whole lot they could do as long as something didn't violate the Fair Housing Act or any other kind of federal regulations. Um, the deed restrictions, unfortunately, um, or fortunately, depending on the neighborhood, um, you know, wouldn't be superseded by local or state regulations. So we're, I mean, 10 minutes from when we normally cut off. What? <laughs> well, I'm just saying, we've only got like 10 minutes left. So That's true. Sure. normal end time. So we're, I don't think we're going to deliberate, but right. do you want us to just quickly give a list of issues we would like staff to be prepared to discuss? Or, I mean, how do you want to? Move forward. And because there's two hearings on your agenda, you don't have to vote to continue till 11. But 10 o'clock is when you guys usually just shut down. I'm sure Will they would be happy if we quit at 10. <laughs> I was to say, it's been a long. <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> yeah. um, well, so given that we do have three, for such a we do have time. three weeks. Oh, Will is well, just I was talking. Just saying that. Part of, the, part of the issue with long meetings, and I think some of you would probably agree with me on this, is that after you listen to so much information for such a time, some of it begins to get jumbled up with something else and whatever. I mean, me, I'm looking up, I've got my other computer over here, so I'm looking up some of the responses, some of the, some of the answers, some of the answers, some of the um, some of the statements, some of the policy notes that I'd want to be, you know, I'd want to know more about before I have more discussion. There were three or four pretty salient issues that I think brought up tonight, the housing density, the um, is it DEI. Um, one thing that wasn't brought up, but it's in some of the notes is tree canopies and how we deal with that. And then the neighborhood hubs thing, I mean, I've got to admit, I still don't understand how all that's going to happen. So, you know, I'm trying to look up what does it say in this document about that? Because I can't remember what page that was on. You know, so um, so that's one reason why two hours is a... Funny. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, Not just, so, it's near my bedtime. Come on. Yeah. Well, since since we do have two more meetings, with what I said before, we could still do that at the end of the next meeting, and then people will still have time to testify in the third meeting. So, I'm fine. Yeah, would end. they, would they not testify at the next meeting, Mark? They, 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 they could. could. The point I was making earlier is if some of us intended to make changes, oh, and we didn't yeah. bring those up until after everybody had an opportunity to testify, I get, yeah. And if people had pushback to that, 
they would be frustrated that they couldn't voice it. Right. Yeah. Well, so from a, Jenny, from a Jenny's got his hand up. From a, from a very selfish standpoint, I would really like you guys to h highlight a couple of the issues that you might want more information on between now and next week so that I can get David to work on it for the next <laughs> three days before he leaves. <laughs> because I'm the staff person after that. <laughs> And I need, I need, uh, so I need, uh, I need his thoughts here over the next couple of days before he leaves. You know, I also believe that council has submitted some comments back to staff already prior to um, tonight's testimony. So um, I, it would be great if you would in writing quickly, I, if you want to try and say it tonight too, but if you can just encapsulate your thoughts into writing for Denny, that would be really helpful for all of us. And if we could do that somewhat quickly, we'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I did find Councillor Heisey's comments and then the answers helpful and I'll try to put mine into the writing. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. yeah I we can do that. that. I can right. do that. I can do that. Did I, did I use up my one chance, Denny, or do I, can I use more? No, you can, you can, uh, you've got lots of chances yet. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> oh. Can, I, can I ask a clarifying question of Denny, I guess? So there was a lot of discussion before the Planning Commission, well, there was discussion in passing about park master plans and them not being ancillary documents in the future and I was confused and, and also I noticed that this document says it will have a list of the ancillary plans but we didn't actually get that list. Um, so could you just clarify what the plan is for how to deal with park master plans going forward and if you could get them to send us the list of ancillary documents before it leaves. Yeah, we can we can definitely respond in terms of how we're dealing with the ancillary documents and but in terms of the parks plans the idea being that they are no longer part of the comprehensive plan but they are the adopted implementation plan for that park so much like the, the, from here on out, they'd be adopted by resolution. Any revisions would be a would be a resolution that sets that plan in place. Um, so it's not it's something that you can change because we've had every one of the parks plans we've got has had some um, variation that has needed to be addressed as part of the the build out of those plans. And rather than have to continue to make interpretations of a plan document, it would be much easier um, if they are spelled out by resolution and we can get those type. So when there's a change, it's a, it's a simpler um, effort at the council level. So you talked about with the planning commission about them being uh, community service chiefs. Um, yeah, um, right. And so, will the existing will we do? Will we take some action to convert the existing plans to a community service use? Or are you just saying any new parks that come? I, the way the way it would work is the council adopts a master plan by resolution, but the planning commission adopts the community service use. For, for that. So it's, it's much like um, what we do for certain transportation projects in a way as well. It's like the, the council's the funding agency, the um, comprehensive plans, the land use agency that, that, that reviews it. And it doesn't, the, the, that doesn't get to the council unless there's a, um, uh, an appeal of the community service use. If that if that makes sense, so you're you're you've got the controls over it ultimately because you're you're funding it or you're, you're you've got that kind of management role, um, but you've got the but the but the planning commission is the body that's actually dealing with how that park fits in the 
in the community in terms of land use. So can we take an actual example of Balfour and Bowman and Gray, which yeah. were the subject of master plans adopted four or five years ago? Mm -hmm. So now what would happen with those? When, the, when they actually come up to have enough funding, what would happen with those? I'm not sure that we need to do anything if there if it's still cons if it's consistent with the last plan that was adopted. If they needed a modification, is there a major minor modification Com process? Community service use, and it may be a, it may be, if it was major, it would go through the major process. If it's minor, it would be a, a type two change. And I'll look back at the policies to make sure that that's the direction we, we were saying, but that was that was kind of what, what we've been thinking all along. David, do you have any thoughts on, you know, do you recall anything differently? Well, I mean, our, our ultimately our plan is to have an implementing zone for parks and other public spaces. So that would actually reduce the need for the community service use process. Um, okay, I was just gonna ask who would be the appellant? Who would? If, if I mean, if if under us, well, okay. So the if the planning commission were to deny the community service use change, who would appeal? Only on appeal. It, it, generally, it would be but, the neighbor. Well, I guess so. That's my question. You said ultimately the council. So if the council, you know, is is you know approves of a park, and the planning commission disagrees. We would be relying on a neighbor to to bring an appeal to the council. So I don't think we'll have ultimate anything. <laughs> so I don't think that's necessarily true. If this is if I'm understanding this process correctly, we'd have to rely on a neighbor. So maybe I was misunderstanding your your question, um, but it would be the. If the planning commission were to deny the the park plan, um, it could be a, it could be a neighbor, it could be the parks district. I mean, the, the, the body that we can't appeal we can't appeal a city a, a city decision. I mean, this came up with uh, with one of the um, one of the other city actions, but we can't have a. Um, the city can't appeal its own decision. Yeah, so I think this is problematic. Yeah. Right? Can I jump in quickly? Yeah. So um, wouldn't ideally the NCPRD be the applicant? They would be, say, for example, Balfour Park, they wanted to do major modifications to it. They would be the applicant for a major modification to their community service use, their parks master plan. And, and the city would be, the planning commission would be the ones deciding. Planning commission doesn't go for it, NCPRD could appeal it. I, I think that's how it works, but maybe I'm wrong. That sounds reasonable since they're the ones that bring the master plans to the planning commission. And the last time I remember the city council discussing, it was for North Clackamas Park. It would have been six to seven years ago. Seven years ago, maybe. Lisa, you may remember that. North I don't know High? I... No, it was 2010. I recently looked that up. Yep, 2010. Yeah. Can we come oh, back to you? Longer than I thought. <laughs> yeah, but, but it yeah, was the PRD who, who was, um, who was uh, bringing yeah. it, who was appealing, yeah. We can come back with uh, with describing this in a little yeah. more detail. Yeah. Okay. There's there is one thing out of the written comments that I I just wanted to call up and ask if we could have a quick yes. Council would like to request this formally uh, of staff because we did receive several comments calling out the same thing I called out, and that is in the the very first paragraph of the Milwaukee history section. I had asked if we could if we had run that. Um, synopsis of Milwaukee's history of, of the native peoples past the Grand Ronde tribes 
Um, oh, yeah. Does the rest of council agree that that is something we would like to do? Because I would like to make sure that we have that whatever edit available to the public for reaction on that third meeting. Yeah, I think that's really important. And and we, we yeah, I, I saw your question. I had the exact same um, question. And I also saw staff's response that we were relying on um, some, some back and forth that I know that the Milwaukee Historical Society had, but I, I think that it um, it does need to be directly um, consulted. And how would council feel about, I, I also made a similar request regarding the history of Japanese American internment. So that that is one that I had written down to comment on. So I would love it if there's information to be found um, through the VK Center specific to Milwaukee. I have always heard that a fair number of uh, Japanese families did get their land back, that local farmers farmed it and turned it back over to them. Uh, I'm sure that wasn't everybody, but I, I was worried about making too blanket of a statement there. And so I would love to have a little research done on that. And I have, I have asked, suggested to the museum of the um, um, there's an older, and I don't even know if they're still with us anymore, but there was an older Japanese couple who lived near, um, 37th and uh, Harrison. I'm sorry, 37th and. Um, Perhaps we don't actually reveal that, Lisa, no, no. That, that these people no. may not want to be identified publicly. That I, um, I really encourage them to try and get oral histories from, but I don't think that ever happened. And I don't know um, if the people are still with us. But anyway, yeah. I've been told that there was a relatively uh, good history in Milwaukee in terms of. Uh, some of the Japanese farmers coming back and having their farms. I had a, I wanted to also bring up that um, you know we we honor Ah being um, and his contributions to um, the orchards here, but we don't mention the Chinese exclusion laws that cut off the immigration and forced um, forced most of the laborers to return home or be separated from their families. Those racist laws remained on the books um, well into the 20th century. So I think the history section has quite a bit of work to do and I'd like to have um, both all three of um, those perspectives researched and, and, and vetted by um, direct communication um, with, with different jurisdictions and, and the historical societies. Yeah, I, my comment was similar, that the history was very white-centric. Um, and it didn't cover the, the you know, I don't know how much specifically Milwaukee did this or, or was involved or how much, but, you know, African-Americans were uh, not allowed to own land in Oregon up to a certain point. Um, you know, there's... There, there needs to be more in the history, and I particularly on the Native American side, I feel like, you know, it's a, it's a two-sentence mention, and then we go on and on about, you know, Seth Llewellyn and stuff like that. So I, I think there's opportunity to, to have a history that's a little more robust yeah. and inclusive. Inclusive, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's just, even if we make this section longer, I think it's really important I, I think that the um you know the the the, the information um about the the suburbanized growth i think that's also really lacking in some detail about um how those opportunities were limited almost exclusively to white people i think you know there's there's plenty to be you know we can i mean i've offered you all the the you know racist and um, classes deed restriction that, that encumbered my home for uh, a long time. It was written in 1941. I think that there's there's a lot we can do, and I and I would like to I will offer some language to staff that we can discuss next time. That would be great. Any any language or any any specifics you can offer would be really really um, helpful.
are there other things that we need feel the need to address tonight or just begin again in a week okay i go ahead i'm still waiting for um um, absolute response back on our UGMA and in land territory, not in the agreement itself, but <clears throat> in the actual area. I think we pretty much determined that we have an agreement with the city of Happy Valley about 205 being the end line for each of us. But our map still shows going over into the east side of 205. So I don't think that's correct. Well, yeah. No, it, it's the actual UGMA boundary with the county. That hasn't changed. But what did change, what, what did it's happen what, is there was an agreement, a letter agreement with Happy Valley about that. So it's so got to go to the county before it, and we've got to get the agreement back from them before it's actual real. Before Doesn't it have to go to Metro too? I think Metro needs to be CC'd on it, but I don't, they, they weren't a party to the original yeah. agreement. Oh, I thought they that. were. But, but, the, but I think what we can do in terms of the map there is, is to just either make a note on the map itself about that letter agreement or um, do, um, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's necessarily a text amendment that we need to make. But I do think that um, adding a note on the map would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I thought I had, um, I thought uh, we had responded to that, but maybe maybe it got clogged up. You somewhere. said you were going to look, continue to look into the fact about with the letter that we had with the city of Happy Valley, I think, and that you would verify that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I know that I know that exists. I just, okay. I, 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 yeah, yeah. All right, thanks, Danny. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right, can I make a motion? Sure. <laughs> I move to continue the hearing on the updated comprehensive plan to a date certain of June 9th, twenty twenty, at five fifteen p.m. I'll second. It has been moved and seconded to continue the hearing on the updated comprehensive plan to a date certain of June 9th, 2020 at 5.15 p.m. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None heard. It passes unanimously. The Hearing will be continued in Um Any council reports? No, I owe you guys some notes on the last watershed council. You're muted. Okay. I owe you guys some notes on the last watershed council meeting, but there was nothing too major from that. Mainly the kind of stay afloat in these days of cut budgets. It would be unfortunate if they failed. They've been a valuable ally. Okay. Just before Will you the, make the motion. Huh? This is a, uh, just before you make the motion real fast. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you for putting your heart and soul into this, and thank you for staying with it to your literal last moment. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you for all your work. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, David. I it was uh, I didn't get to work with you on the CPAC, but uh, watching through all of the planning commission meetings, um, I just want to just sort of let you know how impressed I am with your professionalism. Um, especially and even in the face of, of some pretty, you know, contentious moments. So thank you very much for all of your hard work and, and all of your professionalism. Thank you very much. I appreciate that.
Yeah. I'd like to add, if I can, just one last shout out for Dave. Um, I do want to point out that Dave did his best to stay through the implementation of the comp plan, but some things through our schedule off, so we're a few months behind. Um, but one thing I COVID do about COVID got in the way. <laughs> One thing I do just want to acknowledge about Dave in particular is, um, and this wasn't mentioned, but is the hours and hours of direct contact he had with people from the public. Um, so phone calls, emails, answered, um, always thoughtful, always really professional. Um, so that's in addition to all the other public outreach. And it really takes someone with tremendous uh, vision and spirit to be able to um, have that much energy to respond to folks, especially when sometimes um, the feedback can be hard to hear. And I think uh, Dave's done a really good job of fielding that um, and incorporating uh, those comments into the plan that's before you. So Dave, you've done an outstanding job for us. Um, I'll miss you and uh, we wish you and your family the very best and thank you so much for your major contribution to the city. Thank you, Layla. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, absolutely. We will miss you a lot. Uh, you've been a for sure. really powerful and uh, yeah, Layla said it very well. She, your interactions with people um, have made this a very worthy project and it was getting difficult a little to clamped. Hmm? I'm getting a little bit clamped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. I mean, thank you to the council for all the support for the work that the planning department is doing. Um, you know, I've worked for a number of cities and I've never gotten to know the Planning Commission and especially never gotten to know the City Council as well as I have here in Milwaukee. And I think that's just speaks to your willingness to engage in the important work that we're doing. Um, and, you know, it's been great that several of you, the majority of you started as Planning Commissioners and have continued your, your you know, you, your knowledge of the planning jargon that we all take for granted that not everybody knows. Um, so that's been great. And Angel starting with the VAC and um, Kathy, obviously with a lot of natural resource background and, and other interests in the city. And um, so, yeah, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I would entertain a motion. Right. <laughs> I move that we adjourn. I'll second. It has been I'll moved and seconded it. to adjourn. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Good night, Wilda. Good night, you guys. <laughs> My job.